Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee. We do not have our head coach, Tad Timmerman, with us. Instead, we have special guest, Amber Pierce. How you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Awesome. Good to have you. And we have our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. And we should probably start off with some news, Amber. Uh, first things first. Mm -hmm. She's not a special guest anymore. No. Welcome to the team. <laughs> Yes, Amber, we, uh, we are hiring product managers, and Amber is one of the product managers we hired. So now she is going to uh, design stuff for everyone to use at Trina Road. Super awesome. excited about this. Yep. Yeah. And We're excited to have you. The, uh, so Amber lives in Connecticut. And so anytime she's in Reno, she's going to be on the podcast. And I think we're going to be able to do the, the race analysis where uh, Pete tells me what I'm going to do bad. Amber will also tell me what I'm going to do bad. And I think we can do that remote. <laughs> yeah. So I think every single one of those, uh, she can be on that. So, yeah, that's going to be fun. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so fourth great. host. Pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and Amber, I guess let's share some, because it's been a while since you've been on. Yeah, that's uh, true. And if you, ever want, and if you want to find podcasts that Amber was on prior, just go to... Just search Ask a Cycling Coach Podcast Amber Pierce, and then you'll be able to find all the episodes. They'll pop up right there on SoundCloud or on our blog, any of the different spots where you can find it there. So, yeah, yeah. what's new with you? Uh, not a whole lot. I've been working on a few new projects. So, obviously, since we last talked, I mentioned that I'm shifting from full-time racing to more outreach. So, I've been working on a few clinics. Um, I've got a fun project coming up next year, uh, the Be a Good Wheel campaign. So, stay tuned for more on that. It should be fun. Um, yeah, and, and working for Trainer Road. I guess. But what, uh, so some people don't know who you are yet. This it's true. been a while since you've been on. So That's can you true. give us an overview of your Actually, career? we should probably do that because then that makes it more comfortable for Amber. So Amber raced pro for, for Cannondale for quite some time, pro road yep. racing. In Europe. Um, yep, in Europe. Uh, really successful racer, especially at, at helping out so many, like playing the key role in the in-between parts of the races, right. right? You've won some pro races though too, right? Yes. How many pro wins do you have? Uh, I don't know. Um, probably close to 30. How many pro wins do you have, Jonathan? Uh, zero. Zero. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get that first one, two in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, and, and I Amber, you're tall, uh, relatively yeah. speaking for most like female pro cyclists, unless I guess Five, you went ten. to like the Netherlands yeah. or something. I'm yeah. sure they're really tall, yeah. but, uh, so being a tall rider, like the cool part is you have such a unique experience because you've ridden like helping out riders and climbing stages, even helping them in flat stages in crits and everything else. Like, mm -hmm. and, and maybe it's also just because of the fact that in women's racing, since there's just, you know, less of women pro racers too, that, that you've been able to like fill a lot of cool roles where you weren't like shoehorned just into one. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was really nice. I mean, I started out my career racing for domestic teams like Webcore and Tipco, and then I moved overseas and then raced full time in Europe. And so I've been able to really sample the racing culture here in the U.S. versus the racing culture in Europe. I raced all over the world. Um, and, yeah, I had a lot of different roles on a lot of different teams. But the role that I really loved the best was the domestique role. And so for folks who don't know that term, it's an old French term that means helper, but it's a really specific role on a professional cycling team where you're really facilitating the success of a teammate because – Ultimately, only one person can stand on the top of the podium. Mm -hmm. And when you're on a professional team, the whole goal is you don't really care who that person is as long as they're in your jersey. So <laughs> <laughs> that was really my goal was um, to be that person on the the key person on the team to help make that happen. Depends on the team, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Some teams. This is true. <laughs> they seem to yeah, kind they don't of care. just take like, the earpiece out, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, last year that was very visible, wasn't it? The other thing you should know about Amber is she is a was a D1 collegiate swimmer at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And you won like state and high school and stuff. Amber and I actually went to high school together, yes. mm -hmm. which is crazy. I used I to know. live with Pete. Uh, <laughs> this is a small world. I know. Man. Yeah. Um, I swear it's me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just your world. It's, it's just exactly me. it. Yeah, um, yeah. But so Amber, she does know this now, but I am going to highly peer pressure her to join us in our Kona or our Iron Man stuff in two years. Oh, yeah. And so pressure her now because then we're going to have a question later where we get to pressure ourselves even more oh, good. on this that has to do with Iron but Man training. But everyone think about it. Uh, D1 collegiate swimmer and then professional cyclist who's who's like specialized. You're really good at time trials, right? Time trials Not the best in the world. But I, I told her she should be able to look at the start list and know who could beat her based yeah. on the list. I mean, this is all too. You're not going to train like you are. Probably not like when you, when you were a professional. Right. So you're going to be. I'm retired, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but still. I think Amber, I think if there was like, a, you know, we've talked about who would be fastest between the three of us. I think oh. Amber. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you but should being win that your age good group. of a swimmer, you know, and it's, yeah. Crazy she's not fast. a runner? Yeah, that's. 
that's the key part. <laughs> I think you will get at least 30 minutes, though, on the run and swim or on the swim and bike. Everyone knows that running doesn't matter with triathlon, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can walk, run it. But anyway, that'll be exciting. <laughs> that was a joke, everybody. We can, uh, yeah. we can get you fast through yeah. uh, professional running form coaches. Because I think that's your issue is probably running form rather than uh, aerobic engine. I, that's probably true, but I feel like you're really confident for not having seen me run yet. I think she'd be fine. I think you'll be fine. <laughs> you can, I think bad. she'll be really fast. I bet bad. you could do a four. I'm looking for my wife. I bet you could do a four-hour marathon if you're doing like a five-hour bike. Yeah, and like a sub-hour swim. It's not going to take that much out of you, especially like on the swim. You I'm really going to emerge from the swim run. like a like a wet cat, like after being bathed <laughs> for an hour, like just panicked and exhausted. And then the bike part won't be tough for you, relatively speaking. It's probably going to feel like really low intensity, right? Because like usually, depends. On. Like, She's like I'm walking the run anyway, so I just well go. <laughs> might as well go hard the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, it'll be that interesting. That might have to be my tactic. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, uh, for for the best in the age group, Amber. Oh yeah. Most likely to qualify, Amber. Amber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's all going in your favor. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about. So being back east. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also a friend of the podcast, Ted King, uh, Ted and Laura King, and oh yeah, and, and congrats to them on on the little one that's on, along the way, which is yeah. great. Uh, but Ted helps put on a couple of rides, mm -hmm. uh, the the King Challenge, uh, which really it goes to fundraising for a really good cause. But then also Rooted Vermont mm -hmm. is another one that he does, and I want to do Rooted Vermont. It's at the end of July next year. You're going to do it, yeah, right for sure. That would be yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a gravel race back east. And I do want to do it. I have to look at my schedule, but that could be fun, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. If listeners, well, why if wouldn't you go? If you're, yeah, I <laughs> know. If you're listening to this and you're doing that race, let us know. You can go to forum.trainerroad.com. This is episode 237. Just search for that. Jump in and let us know, or just start a thread. Route of Vermont. You can do that too. We should pick a gravel race that we do each year, and then like everybody can come and join yeah. us. It'd be fun. Yeah. So. We'll have to have Chad come too. And yeah. for those interested, last year Laura King and I put together a women's gravel retreat in June. Oh, cool. So that if you're new to gravel, you're not sure what it's about, or you just want to come and brush up on some skills, uh, we do a women's retreat. We work on skills, um, everything to do with training. Often, you know, the questions and the issues that we run across are universal and a lot bigger than just bike racing or just gravel. Mm -hmm. um, but we do that on a weekend in June, and that way you can start practicing and applying what you learn there to prepare for Rooted later in the year. So um, we will be doing that again this year. Stay tuned for more details on uh, when that's going to happen. I, uh, I, I didn't ask you about this, but I think you're okay with it. I, so my wife is very afraid to ride outside. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, in the summer when Amber's here, oh, yeah. could you coach her? Absolutely. Because she's got swimming okay down now. and uh, mm -hmm. Actually, too. Ryan Evans is her, her, her swim coach, so she's pretty good on and that. She's a good much. runner. She's a very good runner. Very good yep. runner. She should outrun you, unless you figure out how to ride. <laughs> yeah. She should outrun me. <laughs> I can say yeah. that right now. <laughs> yeah, she's really good at yeah, that. But other than that, it's, she's, yeah. Anyways, that's cool. cool. Do you yeah, ever do road clinics fun. for women? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of my favorite things is to get people on really enjoying their bikes, whether it's on road or gravel. I don't, I'm, I'm a roadie, so that's where my skill set is. Is it more than one day, usually? <laughs> yeah, usually. Cool. Uh, we've had clinics that are a day. We've had clinics that are half a day. We've done stuff like a ladies' night. Um, but it's usually most effective when you have most of a day or a couple days. Next time you have that, let us know, and yeah. maybe we'll fly out to Connecticut, especially if it's with another big race. Yeah, because that would be cool for her too to learn with a bunch of people. That'd be well, cool. we might have an event in Healdsburg in May too. So I have no clue where that is. California. Oh, Cal. hey, yeah, Even perfect. Easier. Yeah. yeah, there yeah. we go. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Uh, a couple of things to take care of really quick. A big exciting day for us yesterday. Plan Builder is live. Woo! Nate, do you want to explain the basics of what, even though we talked about yes. it before, but the basics of Plan Builder? Plan Builder is you put in your events or races, and then we build a plan for you up to two years, have you taper, put in A, B, and C events, uh, openers, rest after that, all the complex stuff that we've talked about the podcast too much. About we, like when to, yeah. how to extend a plan, when to shorten a plan, a changing order, which phases. Yes, yeah. because if you, if you don't have exactly... 28 weeks, yeah, it's, 30 or whatever it it's is hard for to, different racing. It's hard to do it. So uh, features that are coming up is we, we are working on... Um, so you can plan vacation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then two other things, Amber's actually working on both of these. Um, one is we're adding something, we haven't announced this yet, but we're putting in a, a spot where you can say if you're sick, like as an annotation on the calendar, and also menstrual cycle. Um, yes. And that will then be plugged in. We think it's good information right now for women to know to like see it based on your training. Mm -hmm. But Huge. that's plugged in for future stuff. So that we, we need the data now, we need a lot of data. So that's mm -hmm. why we're doing it early. Mm -hmm. um, so then we can do other features based on that. 
Well, it's hugely helpful as a woman. If it's not something that you've been paying attention to, uh, tracking your cycle with your training and just seeing how mm-hmm. how your training changes, how your recovery changes, if it does, um, getting a feel for what what what's going on with your body throughout your cycle and how it affects your training is huge, 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 super, yeah. super helpful. Just yep. knowing that and seeing it for yourself is is amazing. Uh, th- some other things too with Plan Builder, you can access it right now. If you just go to trainerroad.com, then you just go to the training plan section, you'll see the spot where you can start it. It's super, and a lot of people have been talking about it like on Instagram and some other stuff that we've seen where people are like, it's like building and pricing a car. It's like, <laughs> like I get to like figure out what my season would be like if I did this race. And then you get to a point where you can look at it and look dive deep into the whole plan that you have. And then you don't necessarily have to throw it on your calendar. You mm-hmm. can once you find the plan that you actually want. And then you can always adjust it later too, which is a big thing. Yep. Uh, oh, we, we Sorry, we added that feature mm-hmm. um, where if you add a event or race later on, it will repopulate it to like take into account for that. Yep. As long as it's not an A race, that's eight weeks within another A race. Yep. I know some people are like, I'm doing A races one month apart. Like you, you can't really yeah one's higher priority you can't taper for two in a row yep yeah and we've put together a whole so there's a blog post we go to blog.trainerroad.com and we summarize what plan builder is right there give you a lot of information that you can have on it it's for athletes of all types even if you don't have an event you Mm -hmm. just want to be fit and or you just want to train like a certain type of athlete but you don't have a goal event you can do that too plan builder will just train you like that athlete for a year or if you put down this like an end date for your plan then it'll figure that out too and it's you can change neat. volumes in the middle like you can change volumes you can have different blocks be different volumes but in the middle let's say you pick high volume and then when you get to like build you're like no way you can <laughs> switch it to mid volume yep uh Really super cool. handy or like work just gets busy for the next six weeks right it's, or choose right. outside workouts yes. so like in the summer you're like saturday yeah. and sunday should be outside workouts on a garmin or wahoo head unit and then that rest are inside and that can be a different block than like your winter training yep so and it's worth saying you can make your entire plan you just flip the switches right there when you're making it in plan builder you can make it all inside all outside a mix you can do anything that you want like that it's really really cool Good job, Brandon, and of the team. Yeah, of Brandon course. was the product manager on that, and then uh, a lot of hands are on this one. Like too many, I I'd have to look at a list because I'd forget people. <laughs> yeah, a lot. So thanks for everybody uh, pitching in on that. The last thing I want to say is that within that uh, within that post, and then uh, producer Tucker, I'm sure you'll be able, sure you'll be able to link to this in the forum post. But we also have a list of frequently asked questions there too, so you can go through there, and that's a good way to learn even more about it. And uh, yeah, so. Tons of cool stuff. This is the like we've talked about this plenty of times about like one of the core principles that we believe in here is constant improvement, like individually, as a company, and also definitely in the product. And it's really because we know that you're driven cyclists and you do the same thing, right? So and this is one a huge step for us, like in this regard. Because I think that this is gonna give people the best training experience they could have. And it's just awesome. We're really excited about it. So check it out. Uh, if you haven't checked it out because you aren't a train road user yet. Give it a shot. Uh, We do have a 30-day guarantee, so you can give that a shot there. Job postings, Nate? Yes, we still have, uh, again, that will be forever, but Reaction uh, Native Engineers. We have uh, room for one more C-sharp engineer. And then if you're local, there are still some customer support team uh, openings. Mm -hmm. And you can go to trainroad.com slash jobs for that. Now, Special announcement. I don't don't know what this is about because it just see it (laughs) tossed onto the dock here. So we just did a... uh, PM product management offsite. Mm-hmm. We hire, hire two new product managers. We have a third one starting in April. Amber and David. Hi, yep. David. Hi, Good David. To have you. And so uh, we went to Lake Tahoe and we discussed stuff and we had a few drinks. Amber told me that I can drink up to two drinks to be just fine. <laughs> so we just had very large two drinks for my, Good. my ramp Good. test and yep. stuff. Um, and we get, got to thinking and. Uh oh. So <laughs> Sophia and I uh-huh. are doing. Cape Epic uh-huh. in 452 days. No, yeah. 52 days. Yep. Yep. Just right around the corner. Plus yeah. or minus because the time zones, you know. <laughs> yeah. I bet Sophia just like cringed hearing the day count right there. Yeah. <laughs> no, sure. no, she's, she's, she's looking forward to it, but it's like, it's she's more be competitive than I am. She's like, oh, yeah. Let's get in three weeks early <laughs> yes. to heat acclimate. Like, oh, yeah. No, not that she's regretting it. She's looking forward to it, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we had some discussions and there is a new team coming after us. Okay. Brandon Need and Amber. Pierce, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> so I just, just do the math in your head right there. Yeah. <laughs> that is a competitive team. Yes, it is. It's a really competitive team. So who's going to win? Uh, between you and Sophia and Amber and Brandon. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to come down less to on the bike and more off the bike stuff, personally. I mentioned Ooh. that with Brandon because Brandon mm-hmm. does not eat a lot. Yeah. Brandon hasn't figured that out yet. 
but I did talk to him yesterday. And if, for those that don't know, Brandon is one of our product managers. He's like plus five watts per kilo at all times. He was at the Olympic Training Center for triathlon for a good period of time. He's an incredibly fast runner, mm -hmm. ex-pro triathlete, really fast Cat 1 now, I think. Cat 1, yeah. Cat 1 road cyclist and, and now a mountain biker. So, But he hasn't figured out fueling yet. So if he can well, yeah. figure that out, that will be huge. By but, the way, that just happens to be my specialty. You're yeah. good at that. Amber said she is <laughs> well, the I mean, human many... garbage disposal. Well, That's not, right. <laughs> not just that, but like how many like, you know, races have you done like this? Like it's it has to be what you do when you're a pro athlete racing at the pro level like that. You like if eat. you don't figure that out, you're just not going to make yeah. it. So that's going to be interesting. But I also think off the bike or maybe even on the bike, it's how the two riders or how the two get along. I think is going to be a big thing. Oh, they'll too. get along fine. So, well, I know, but I'm, I'm Sophia. She's an Argentine. She's a Latina, strong-willed woman. Nate, you have a very particular way about how you go. Um, I'll go all in beta. My <laughs> wife's just like that. So like, I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> okay, yeah. this will be good. Okay, then that's gone. Yep. She's I, in charge. We man, know this. Who would do? Man. Okay, so here's yeah, exactly. I had the same thought. I like looked up in the air and yeah. thought, okay, so I am the slowest up and down mm -hmm. on uh, my team. Yes. Off the bike, I'll eat the most. Yes, you will. Um, going up out of Amber and Brandon, Amber will be slower than Brandon. Brandon. stronger. Yeah, going even up. at your pro level. Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. No, going down, I he's, think, like, he's like genuinely world-class yeah. right? climbing. Yeah. 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 Um, going down, I think Amber's gonna be faster than Brandon. So in my mind, I have to have a higher watt kg than Amber to be able to climb faster, and I have to descend better than Brandon. Because Sophia is not going to be limited by either of those. Yeah. Right. And then yeah, the, Sophia is crazy fast up and down. And on the flats, before I was like, that could be our advantage, but Amber and Brandon should be able to work pretty well together. <laughs> they on will the work. They'll be better on the flats, I think. Yeah. Well, it depends. Like Sophia, she's her 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 threshold just continues to rise is because she hasn't been doing this for a really long, relatively speaking. Yeah. So she just continues to get like really big bumps still every year. But the draft. And that's the so thing. It's Amber's, gonna be you. Amber's Basically. like the same height as Brandon, right? Pretty close. I think so, yeah. So, so you'll be able to rotate and have evenly balanced drafts, whereas yeah. for you, it's basically just you. Like I'm you're, like more than a foot taller than her. Your socks are going to get a great yeah. draft from <laughs> Sophia, and that's like it. So Anyway, so this is like Sophia has the you know the goal for us to win, which is oh going to happen. Hey, but, no, positivity. <laughs> but this is something that like now it's close, and there's something I can see every day. So I, this motivates you even more. Every time I took a bite of food, Brandon said your watt per kg just went down, Ooh. which I disagree because that's his head, right? Yeah, exactly. that's, that's how Brandon I'm, thinks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that thinking. You put Brandon. We think he should be like Julian Alaphilippe. Brandon's like 130 ish. Yeah, 135 ish. He should be 155. Yeah, and he would win so many races. Yeah, so many races. Yeah, if his if his threshold increased proportionately to that, yep. and then also that would mean that he's eating more and he's got mm -hmm. more on board and he'd just be able to do more. He also wants to go to a Xterra National Champ this year. I think he would do really well yeah. if he can if he can figure out the bike handle, which he totally can. Uh, we went to North Start with him that one day. He improved so much, really and quickly. it was amazing how fast he improved. I mean, he's just naturally talented, but also really knows how to be good at something really quick. So, anyways. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Man, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I, I I, feel like with that one, it could go either way. So maybe it's like the mistakes that, that cost it, you know? Yep, it could be a flat tire. Well, thing. a race right. like that, there's so much luck involved, too, this, yep. which yeah. is impossible. I mean, there's just so much beyond your control, but it's going to be a lot of fun. There was This initiated a lot of trash talking on the weekend, and I'm excited to see. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> glad. I'm so glad that I'm not getting roped into it. Yeah, that's 20, good. It's going to be 2021. Yeah. Uh, and... I think we could have a big advantage if I can get my descending skills a lot better. I know it's not mm -hmm. that technical, mm -hmm. but you can just you get separation if there's like a group and stuff. It, mm -hmm. it could be cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you're descending. Uh, we've mentioned this before, but your descending is really good now. I'm better than Brandon. Y yes, you are. Okay. Brandon right tried now. to tell right me now. that he was better or as good as me at Tahoe. <laughs> no, you're it's not you're happening. you're really fast now. I, thank so, you, Jonathan. That's and that's genuine. That's not me. Just because he's my boss. That's just me saying straight up. He's fast. Before so. he told me, I had room for improvement. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but in a positive way. <laughs> Anyways, so that was the announcement, Ooh. and uh, it'll. Pretty this cool, is right? going to be interesting, yeah. And, and Pete's and, still trying to rope Chad. <laughs> I was just going to say, what's the status on that? Team? Chad said, uh, "Well, but he's like, I'm not doing Cape Epic ever." And then he heard that uh, Amber and Brandon were going. He's uh -huh. like, "Well, maybe I will." Yeah. Uh -huh. So me, uh -huh. he doesn't uh -huh. care. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, a couple last things really quick. We have, if you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash trainer road, you can join us live here every week, Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific. We'd love to have you join us because then we can go into some of the live chat and answer some questions, which we'll do at the end of this episode. But also you can see some of the race analysis that we, that we put up and all the different videos that we put up. A video almost every single day. So during the week, it's every day. Weekends, we usually give you a break. So uh, on right now, we have race analysis from Dunnigan Hills and Sassoon. Those are two criteriums that Nate raced recently or uh, road a race. road race in a criterium mm -hmm. that Nate raced recently and some really good takeaways from Pete there so check those ones out and then I have a story about that yeah go ahead. Right, so and we have the actually continue then I'll tell you the story okay that, yeah so and another piece that we're going to we're going to try our best to get it out tomorrow which would be friday the 20th of december uh, may end up going up on monday or something after two so stay tuned for it just the same you can hit the notification bell on youtube so then you can figure that or figure out when we post something but we're putting together almost all the races that you did to go from cat five to cat two in a year which is pretty cool. There's a couple ones. Oh, we missed the video, but mm -hmm. so you'll be able to see like the finishes mm -hmm. that you were doing as we went through that, and it's kind of cool to just see like what it takes to go all the way through that because that's a big accomplishment. Once again, Huge. good job, Nate. Yeah, Thank you. Congrats. So, Amber was watching those. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the finishes she laughed at. <laughs> <laughs> and we've laughed at. I'm sure Amber's laughed at some of her own finishes too. Absolutely. We, we do that yet? Uh, I do not take myself that seriously. <laughs> but also, she's like, "Oh, is this blah blah blah? Oh, I won that one. Oh, I won that one. Yeah. I won that one too." The only Pete and I figured out the only one she didn't win were the races that were so new yeah. that she was in Europe. She's mm -hmm. like, "I had a flat tire there, and my chain was coming off, and I won that one." And uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah, it'll be cool. Yeah, pretty cool. So uh, you can check that out. Do we have that one out Friday? We think so. By the time you listen to this, it might be up on YouTube. If not, the next week. Tucker, yeah. Are you out on Christmas week? No, I'll be here. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then, so uh, yeah, so tune in for that. Then go to the blog because Megan, our, one of our awesome copywriters and fast bike rider herself, she just wrote a blog post on rest and recovery, the difference between rest, recovery, and tapering, and why it's important for athletes and how to Huge. utilize it. So really helpful, really succinct blog post that she's always putting up. So check that out. Let's get into David's question. My question is, since bikes have gotten so expensive, so expensive, I bought a carbon cyclocross bike. It still costs a couple thousand. Is there much of a difference when using this type of bike on the road versus an actual bike? He says, oh, and by the way, my an actual bike. Yeah, an actual <laughs> bike. It's still a bike, man. Road bike. Um, Road bike. All the cross people are just fuming mad after hearing that, right? <laughs> uh, it says, oh, and by the way, my FTP has gone up by about 50% since I started using Trainer Road. Great job. Before we dive into this, one thing I need to say here is Courtney McFadden, uh, so mm -hmm. friend of the podcast, she all she was so close to beating out Katie Compton for third place at nationals last weekend. So close. Um, she had a crash and then she just couldn't quite close the gap. Um, so, so close. Uh, but Courtney, you should be proud of yourself. It was an amazing fourth place result and cool because it was her hometown and she mm -hmm. led the first lap and then she hung right there with the group. Did you watch it at all? No, I haven't. But it's uh, really she good is, race. Spoiler alert. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't reveal the top two. <laughs> so. She was on uh, the podcast. Yes, she was. You can search Courtney McFadden and look for that one. And she's also, if you give her a follow on her social channels, you'll learn a lot about PT and everything else. She struggles a lot with like uh, with like recurring overuse injury, that sort of stuff. And she's just she takes a really proactive approach with it and does a lot of PT and shares a lot about what she does. So you can get some good tips there if you deal with similar things. Well, honestly, any sport you get into, it's not a bad idea to just Google overuse injuries for your sport <laughs> and what you can do to prevent them because the things to, to prevent them are so easy. It's, it's true. It's so easy. But then it's not until you actually have the injury that you're like, why didn't somebody tell me this? Yeah, when right? I and then it's hard, right? Because then once yeah. you have the injury, it's hard to get rid of the, yes. the issues that you so have. So the preventative preventative yeah. work is really great. So with a resource like that, it's invaluable. Yep. So we're going to go into the differences. I'm going to get nerdy with numbers first, um, but I'm actually just going to tell you what the numbers mean. I'll actually, we'll put up this spreadsheet and we'll make it public so then people can see. Uh, but I laid out a spreadsheet that compared, and there's a website actually, you can go to geometrygeeks.bike, I think is what it is. Uh, then, is that your website? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Collecting ad revenue, no. <laughs> um, it's, these, it's a website that if you Google like X geometry for whatever bike name it is, they come up pretty high now. And it's a good thing because they have a really good website where you can compare any number of bikes. I think you can compare like 10 bikes if you wanted. And then you can see the geometry differences on all of them right next side, like side by side. It's really helpful. So with that, we basically looked at, since you, obviously, Amber, in this case, are a Cannondale athlete. So yes. we looked at the difference between their road bike, their cross bike, and then their gravel bike, which road bike is a Super 6 Evo. 
quick question. Is yeah. this the new geometry on the new Evo? Yeah, the okay, new one. Cool. Yeah, new, new. So, new, new. Uh, which is a really pretty bike. I like that one. Uh, and then the Super X, which is their cross bike, and then the Top Stone, which is their gravel bike. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to get into the number differences and what those would mean in terms of how they feel. And then we'll talk about, because then there's obviously everything else that goes with these bikes. So it's going to go road, cross, gravel. Yeah, exactly. And the Super 6 Evo, so that one, and this That's is... the road, sorry. This is the road one? Yeah, yeah please jump confusing. in with that. Please jump in with mm -hmm. that. The names are really close. Super X and Super 6? Yeah. We can just close. go Evo. Evo is the road bike. Sounds right. good. Yeah. On the Evo, so and this is traditional with a lot of road geometry. Bikes don't really stray too far these days, right? They're kind of similar. Mm -hmm. it has short chain stays, which means the distance from your pedals to the axle of your back wheel, right? So short chain stays and wheelbase and the lowest bottom bracket. It's going to make it feel snappy and kind of fast on the pavement when you're going through, uh, in between turns. Yeah. It'll make you feel really precise too. Uh, this is kind of a bad word to use for this since Cannondale has a bike with this name, but it's like a scalpel. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, think of that, like it's it's cutting and it's really precise, okay? Yeah. Uh, the layup and construction will definitely make it feel stiffer over uneven terrain. So, and that's aside from the numbers, that means how the carbon's made. So that's gonna make, decide how the bike behaves when you hit bumps and everything Less else. Less compliant. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And then it definitely has like some aero optimizations, which we'll get into in just a bit. Uh, so, but once again, short, low bottom bracket, it's gonna feel snappy. Super X, the, the cyclocross bike, that one has the shortest reach. And when people talk about reach, what they're really talking about is the distance from your bottom bracket to your head tube. So uh, that's something that basically, if that's shorter, that's gonna push more of your body weight over the front wheel, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can take the other approach and you can put a really short stem on your bike and then make it really long, and that's another way to do it. And that's how mountain bikes do it. But for cyclocross, they do it kind of in another way. They just keep it short up front usually. So uh, it has the shortest reach out of all three of these bikes, and it has the steepest seat tube angle. So that means the the basically your seat post extended down to the bottom bracket. A steep seat tube angle means it's going to put you closer to your stem. More upright. More upright. And you're further over the bottom bracket. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So think the the rider is positioned more toward the front of the bike, and that's going to give it more traction on the front wheel, more traction in turns. Uh, it's going to give it a bit more of like a stable feeling. Also, it's going to make it feel like you can make that really tight U-turn that you do in cyclocross right. when they have you weaving in and out of the tape. It's going to make it feel a whole lot easier. And that's do. like the main purpose of that, right? Yep. Is mm -hmm. for tight turns. Really yep. agile handling. Yeah. yeah. And also, uh, once again, traction on the front wheel, because that is really important mm -hmm. when you're dealing with that. It has a higher bottom bracket, and that's to help with clearing pedal strikes and that sort of stuff since you're riding over variable terrain. So that's something to, to remember. And also the interesting thing is that it has longer chain stays, and this is what cyclocross bikes do. So the back of the bike is longer, even though the front's shorter, the back of the bike is a bit longer and that makes up for the stability loss that you would have by having a shorter front part of the bike. So they do all these things to basically make it so that you have better traction and then the bike is still going to handle how you want for cyclocross. You didn't mention this, is the, uh, uh, how slack is it? Less it's slack. actually really similar on these bikes. It's not too far off. Hmm, okay. So yeah, in some cases they'll have a slacker front end, um, but you actually, it's kind of crazy. You'll see on different bikes, like the Venge will, has a pretty slack head tube angle, relatively speaking for other bikes. So, and that's one thing that's kind of fluctuating a lot in the road space. So they're so. talking about the angle of the, the, the head tube and the fork. Yeah. Like think when like those, about those custom yeah. Harleys that have like a really like long front mm -hmm. end on them. And it's like really relaxed. That's a relaxed head tube angle. Something that's really upright. Like look at an old cycle or old uh, cross country mountain bike compared to new ones. It looks like the forks are sticking straight down to the ground. <laughs> that's steep. You too, correct me if I'm wrong, but the slacker it is, the more stable you will feel at in general uh -huh. at high speed mm -hmm. on a straight line and the steeper it is the the more like tighter turns you can do and that will feel really good yeah it will feel uh, a lot faster to react to inputs right to your to your hands which can is a pro or a con mm -hmm. uh, just uh, yeah. like a uh, more relaxed head tube angle it can feel slower to react right so that could be a con so, so downhill bikes slack yes. cross country slack. bikes less and so that yeah. also contributes to compliance for sure so if you're going over rougher terrain more uneven yeah. Yep. So the Super 6, super short, low bottom bracket, really snappy. That's the road bike, the Evo. Now the cross bike, like we said, is one where it's short in the front end, a bit longer in the back end, and it's snappy in turns, but a different type. And then Topstone, their gravel bike. This has the tallest stack, 
which the stack is basically the distance from the axle of your cranks all the way up to the top of the head tube, mm -hmm. right? So it has the tallest stack and it also has the longest front center. So that's going to make it more comfortable basically right. and help on long days, rough terrain. And then it has a slacker seat tube angle. And I think that's because that's going to make it want to flex more under load and it's going to be more compliant, but we'll get into what it does in, right. for that in a bit. Yeah. Um, but then it also has a really long wheelbase. And if you think about the speeds over rough terrain that you get in a gravel race, they're really high compared to most sports so uh, or most disciplines. So as a result, that's going to make it more stable. Uh, something of note, too, if like you were to get and a really easy way to do this is to look at the reach of a bike and then basically the reach of your current bike and then look at your stem length. And as long as you don't have any crazy, like inverted pro roadie stems thing going on, or one that's going way up high, that's an easy way to know what sort of stem you should get. And in this case, like the top stone, if you were trying to get all three of them for yourself, which lucky you, <laughs> if you were doing that, this is definitely where the shortest stem would come in place because of that longer front center that it has. So basically I'm going to recap the road bike is going to feel really snappy. Uh, it's going to be a bike that will feel like it's very precise. The cross bike is not going to feel as precise. However, if you get into bumpy roads, even it's going to behave better. Well, the cross bike is going to feel really precise on the really technical terrain that you would expect in a cross race. On a cross race, right? Mm -hmm. But not as much as a road bike specifically designed for pavement. Yep. The cross bike wouldn't feel as precise as a road bike on pavement. Yeah. yeah. In Dave's situation, where he's thinking, "Can I ride this on the road?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, you Absolutely. totally can for sure. Chad Absolutely. did it in Hawaii for like a week. Yeah, he did. I did too. I brought the bike to Hawaii. Yeah, you rode Haleakala on your on your Crux. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then I've ridden the the Super X actually on a drop ride here, even so, like one of our hard group rides. Yeah. It didn't feel and and I'm but I'm also um, I'm persnickety and fussy and, and detail oriented with this stuff. So yeah, it didn't handle as well as a road bike would, but it was absolutely sufficient. Like in no way was I like, oh, this bike is is making it so that I can't. And I think for people getting their first bike, they should either get a probably actually a gravel bike, mm -hmm. either cross or gravel. But I would go gravel just because it's probably a little more stable on descents. Yes. But if someone wants to do cross, maybe the cross bike rather than a road bike because. You can just change the tires or so you get a easy. different set of wheels. You can do gravel, cross, road, yeah, and then right. all these like gravel cross, like Fondo things that they totally. are road, gravel well, that's things. Another awesome. difference we didn't mention is um, the cross bikes and the gravel bikes will have a lot more clearance for bigger tires. Mm -hmm. So a road bike is going to be more aerodynamically optimized, probably for a narrower tire, but narrow now is 25 mils plus yeah. <laughs> is sort of the norm. Thank goodness. Right, right. <laughs> but, um, and I know even the Evo has clearance for really big tires, but not nearly as much clearance as the Super X would have or the Top Stone would have. And then the Top Stone also has the rear king's, kingpin suspension. Yeah. That is, um, it enables the rear triangle to, well, I guess the seat tube to flex mm -hmm. um, to a pretty surprising degree, which is super, super lightweight suspension. So on those really big gravel grinder days, like gravel grinder races just seem to be getting longer and longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Three, DK XL, 350. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, so yeah. like on, on a big long day and you're on rough terrain, something like that's going to make a really huge difference. Yeah. Um, I even know people who've been on that and said, you know, the, the roads where I live are terrible. I really want this bike just to do all my yeah. my group rides. Cause I could see that for sure. <laughs> also, uh, triathlons. Right. You, you start with one of these, either the Super X or Top Stone, like gravel or cross, mm -hmm. and then you can put put uh, air bars on it. Oh yeah, totally. And totally. you can go in and really when we talk about aerodynamic differences, it's gonna be very small. Oh and, yeah. And uh, yeah. the larger ones are like 30 miles per hour, unless you're really into racing, like you really care. If you just wanna like do some triathlons and get into it, this is a great entry level, not entry level, but uh, one bike for many disciplines. Yes. Yeah. And then you figure out, I'm gonna be an amazing road person, then you can get like, and you then you can specialize. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right? And get into something that's more specific. And it takes a while. It takes a lot of riding to get to a point where you're really going to notice these differences in handling and sensation. Yeah. I mean, if you yeah. did a side by side comparison on the same day, you would probably notice. But if you're just getting into, if you're just getting into cycling or you're, you're dabbling and you just want to try road and you've got the cross bike, absolutely go race a road race on your cross bike. It's a great idea. And if you want to try these bikes, Oftentimes, uh, talk to your local shops uh -huh. because they might have, you know, they might know when and where you could try a demo. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these, a lot of brands will do demo days where you can come out and try different models. And then you could actually do a side by side comparison mm -hmm. and see the differences. But honestly, yeah, I think it's a great way to just get into and try road racing yeah. and decide if that's a direction that you want to go. Single speed national champ and possibly the unofficial single speed world champs, whatever that race was that just happened in St. George. But Sarah, Sarah Sturm. She won the crit at Sea Otter, the, the women's crit at Sea Otter on a gravel bike. Yeah. So uh, 
that that's a fast field that she was racing against right there. Yeah. So I heard Cody Kaiser explain to somebody and say that a cross bike is made for a hundred turns in a race and a gravel bike is made for two turns in a race. Yeah. Yeah. To give that's example. a good way. Yeah. That's a good way. Cause a lot of gravel races you have totally. literally two turns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Katarina rode a gravel bike and cyclocross almost all year up until just recently. Um, so for her Europe trip, she's switched over, but she rode one the whole time. She said, yeah, it is different. And also Katarina is one of the best athletes there is in cycling, right? <laughs> yeah. She has a ton of experience on things. And even though Katarina, even though I know that you would try to act like you don't have detail oriented, you know, tendencies and everything else with equipment, I know you do. <laughs> uh, and as re- she could tell the difference, whereas many people may not be able yeah. to tell the difference. Yeah. Some people like go their whole riding careers and they won't be able to tell the difference. And that, I, I kind of wish that was me. That would be nice to have. Some people ride Carson City Off-Road with their fork locked out and didn't even know. <laughs> Some people. Some people do. Some people. Let's go to Alan's question. It says, love the podcast, longtime Trainer Road subscriber and podcast listener. Five stars. Thanks, Alan. You can give those reviews on iTunes or Google Play Store. Also, if you want to just review Trainer Road in general, we'd really appreciate it. You can go to trainerroad.com slash reviews. That would be super or helpful. Or iTunes. Yep. That's yeah, even yeah. better. Yeah, for the podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, for the app. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. You can do it there too. Yeah. App store. (coughs) Sure. Mm Mm-hmm. Or Androids. All of them. (laughs) I'll just keep interrupting you. Sorry. (laughs) Says question for you guys and gals in this case, I'm a geezer roadie with a reasonable watt per kilogram. Uh, during race season, I typically top out at 4.9 watts per kilogram. That's not reasonable. That is amazing. That is extreme. And especially if you're older, that is like world-class then. Yeah. That's crazy, Alan. So uh, it says, uh, I'm making a switch to XEO style of racing and think I have a fairly good or have fairly good technical skills. Mentions that Alan mentions that he used to race mountain bikes as a junior. So what are the differences? In, oh, man, if you haven't ridden mountain bikes in a long time, Alan, you're going to love the new cross country bikes. It's going to feel amazing because I bet like what he rode, you know, compared. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It says, what are the differences in power delivery you have seen between a road position and a mountain bike position? How do the two differ in FTP? Is there an estimate equation? Like, for example, roughly 10%. And then he says, what are the difference? Or I've done some back-to-back workouts on the trainer on both bikes, and it seems significantly harder to hit the required notes on a mountain bike over my road bike. Perhaps a function of being so adapted to the road position. I'd love to hear what you guys have seen, road bikes versus mountain bikes and power delivery. So uh, let's just cover this one in principle, right? Because this isn't just mountain bike to road. Like this could be one road bike to another. I'm sure Mm -hmm. Amber, you've, sorry, I've got like a fluffy blankie under me and it's throwing hairs everywhere. (laughs) Uh, I'm sure that you have switched from brand to brand or model to model when they've released a new bike. Have Mm -hmm. you ever seen power differences even just road to road? Yeah, even road bike to TT bike is a big one for for roadies. Um, And I think... Honestly, it's just it's a matter of training the efficiency of how your muscle like the the muscle recruitment motor patterns in your pedal stroke. Mm-hmm. I mean, the more trained you get, you're you're training that efficiency. Uh, but then when you train when you switch the geometry, you're so trained in a particular motor pattern, and your that particular motor pattern is so efficient that even a small difference, a mm-hmm. small change in your geometry or body position can actually feel like it, it it's going to impact you know, your, your RPE, it might actually impact your power output. Um, and that can even be changing your body position on one bike over different gradients. Like some people (laughs) really prefer a certain gradient because they're just really well adapted to that particular pattern of Mm -hmm. motor recruitment. That's going to, that's going to be really efficient there. So, um, I think that that's a really crux thing. Yeah. Interesting point on this too. I was just thinking of Ted King again and how good he is over, he has a huge threshold. So that's one thing, right? Yeah. (laughs) Helps. But yeah, kind of helps. Uh, but then on top of that, he's very good at putting out power over uneven rough surfaces, Mm -hmm. which once again, that's like kind of riding your bike in a unique position. There's like just being in one spot and being able to put out the power, you're doing the work and you'll be able to do a huge percentage of that work in a different position. Right. Uh, and that will vary, but it's absolutely, it's normal to see some sort of difference. Nate, you see it too, or you have seen it before, I guess, going from one bike to the other, right? Uh, well, so TT bike, obviously you close your hip sure. and mm-hmm. but uh, Alan, so if, if you, I would look at your saddle relative to your bottom bracket Mm -hmm. and if you have the same setback and the same um, saddle height and you also have to look at your shoes because different pedals will have different like excuse me um different slack or stack Mm -hmm. so it'll be a little bit different and that's we're talking about millimeters here but it can make a difference yeah Yeah, it can totally um especially as you first jump on it and switch yes sorry something's my throat's trying to kill me (laughs) um other than that though you should have a higher like a more open hip angle and you should 
put out more power, I think, on the mountain bike. Maybe not a lot or very close. Mm -hmm. So this is what I would do. Um, I think, Alan, you're talking about, I'm guessing you're saying on the trainer. So mm -hmm. if, if your bike's on the trainer and you're getting power measured from the trainer, it should be very, very close. Mm -hmm. um, if it's being measured by the trainer, I would check your mountain bike chain efficiency or your whole drivetrain. Check that out. Yeah. Mountain bike drivetrains can get crazy dirty. <laughs> but yep. if, if your position's the same and your stack's the same and all you're doing is sitting a little more upright and it's a 10% difference, your chain could be like yeah. destroyed or your other, you know, relative to, to your uh, road bike. The other thing to look out for is um, your power meter. So if you have, if you're using different power meters on both bikes, we've seen it a lot here where they all say they're within 1.5, <laughs> whatever, but they are not. Yes. Um, yeah. So that could be, I mean, you can get a, another third power meter to check, but uh, you might want to look at, uh, you know, make sure you zero it, but there's also some power meters where you can do calibration. And if one is, is like you can get a pedal power base meter or you can use a trainer and say, okay, when I do this one and this one, it's not the chain. Um, there is a difference. You can contact manufacturer and they will, they usually can test it or figure it out if it's low. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, last, oh, last year I got to the, so with the SB 100 and then my Venge, those two bikes, they have the seat tube angles now that I can get like the identical position, which mm -hmm. is nice. Uh, they didn't always have that. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why last year I had identical, like <clears throat> the power and we've talked a lot, like a lot of people when they first start out training indoors, they also, I guess this is kind of a caveat we should mention. So I'll step away really quick from this, but if you're just measuring it indoors and then you're just riding your mountain bike outdoors and you're wondering what the difference is, if you're new to indoor training, it's common to at first experience like an ability or you may not be able to put out the same power that you did because you aren't cooling as much because you don't have everything set up that like, and you're not quite used to it. Um, but for all of us, I know I'm gotten to the point where my indoor, there is no difference between an indoor and outdoor FTP. It's all the same. And it's been really helpful this year because that has been the same as when I'm riding outside on my road bike, as when I'm riding outside on my mountain bike, and it's all the same. And it's been really helpful. But you do, I think that that's a key point, Nate. The big thing to focus on is where the power generation is going. So everything from the feet to the hips, right? And if that's more or less the same and then your hip angle isn't varying too much, then you should be able to put out the same power on both bikes. The other thing is the inertia. So if you're in a really small mountain bike gear, it could feel really weird on the trainer. If yeah. you're on the road bike in a, in a really big gear and you're spinning that flywheel really fast, yeah. that also could be a, a difference in the amount of power. That gets mm -hmm. back to those like recruitment patterns and all the firing that happens, right. like you mentioned there. Like you'll be using the muscles slightly differently at different portions of that pedal stroke, right? Right. Um, exactly. It's not, and it's funny because it's not really worth like getting into the weeds and analyzing the numbers and exactly where the difference is. It's just, you have to know that there is an adaptation period that, that's right. going to take place. And don't right? worry about it. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you're training, you're training, it's money in the bank. You know, if, if you're plus or minus a few watts here and there, I mean, yeah, it's really nice to feel that precision and know that the numbers are right. But if you do, if you're doing a training ride and you're working hard, it's gonna help. It's gonna help your fitness. I know. Yep. And the, well, to the, <laughs> the the power meters themselves are plus or minus. Of like, course. And it changes. Yeah, none of it. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I know. Yeah. It's it, it's. Yeah. People get so caught up on the little details. Yeah. When they've got this big mountain to like start <laughs> yeah. digging out, and they're yeah. like, "But there's grass the on work. here that I need to cut to three <laughs> inches." Yeah. Just, just the do the work. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Ben's question. Uh, this is our opportunity to talk about triathlon. He says, "Yes." <clears throat> Huge fan of the podcast and products you provide. I started triathlon in the spring of 2017. My first sprint distance race was horrible. Hung on to kayaks and buoys on the swim. He's just really describing how mine's going to go, I, I was, think. I, was, I had a joke <laughs> oh, lined up. Thank shoot, you. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> then it says, got passed by an eight-year-old on the bike and walked almost the entire run. My timesheet at the end said I finished 17th out of 16 <laughs> in my age group. No joke. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that's, like, that's like a meme, basically. The right? race director was like, yep, it's <laughs> minus so one. One. Bad minus one. <laughs> uh, so Ben's laughing at himself with this. So uh, we're laughing with you, Ben. He says, despite my poor, poor performance, I was hooked. Since then, I've made a lot of progress, especially since joining Trainer Road in April of this year, which took me to my first age group win in an Olympic distance race this That's past awesome. September. Nice job. Way to That's go. Great. From 17th out of 16 to a win. That's pretty cool. With that said, my question is this. I'm 33 years old. And he says that with an exclamation point, but it seems like such a like middle ground age. I'm not sure how to take that. He says, I started triathlon at the age of 30 and with the exception of some soccer in high school, I did basically no aerobic or endurance training before triathlon. 
My ultimate goal is to qualify for Ironman 70.3 Worlds at some point in the next five years. Did I start too late in life to achieve this goal? The age groupers I see qualifying all come from some kind of running, swimming, or cycling, or just generally athletic background, and have been competing basically their entire life. The only competing I did before 30 was with an Xbox controller in my hand. So... I'm 135, 135 pounds, about 61.2 kilograms, 5'10", and 178 centimeters with an FTP of 209. Do I stand a chance of qualifying? I'm currently doing the low-volume half-distance build plan, and then we'll move to a low-volume specialty before going to the mid-volume half-distance plan. And then just a couple more details. He says, I have a half-distance race in August of 2020 and will be taking my first attempt to qualify for Worlds at Ironman 70.3 Memphis in October 2020. So it's worth saying if he qualifies, he'll be going to St. George because he'll be qualifying for the next one. Um, so to be clear, regardless of your answer, I'm still going to try, so don't feel like you need to give me lip service to motivate me. Uh, thanks for all you do, your friend Ben. So <clears throat> first things, St. George... Uh, I just want to talk about that really quick. The course, it's kind of a hard course, right? I've heard. The hardest. Like it's, it's got Climby. climbs and then it's windy. It's commonly really windy in Southern Utah too. Uh, so that could be, that's a challenging course for sure. Um, so Ben, at your current <coughs> stats, you're like 3.4 watts per kilo. I don't believe it is possible to qualify unless other people have an issue at the current stats. Mm -hmm. That does not mean you're brand new. Yeah. Like totally. these are your stats. Yeah. Um, I wrote down here just like. Stay consistent, eat well, raise your volume, mm -hmm. and you can improve. I don't. I there are plenty of examples of Kona qualifiers who even start like in their fifties and oh, they yeah. do it like nothing before. Yeah, uh, Iron Man loves to like show that. Um, I like that things, story. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so no way possible, or you don't have to do that. I used to be uh, one point like nine eight watts per kilo mm -hmm. when I started, and I just hit uh, three thirty eight. A little heavier now. Yeah. But anyways, three hundred thirty eight. I went from one nine one eighty nine FTP to three thirty eight. And I'm still going to go up. Congrats because again. Because I want to. Awesome. Lots of congrats to Nate this yeah. episode. Yeah. Um, where, where, there's no other. I mean, five to two. And, oh, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, it's all combined. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah. Don't don't pigeonhole yourself that you can't make it because you see other people and they were D1 swimmers or European pros. Right. You can still beat them at Cape Epic. 100%. 100%. Look at that. It's one thing that I, that I see... <laughs> one thing that I see that's positive uh, for him, like like really good, is the fact that he only weighs 135 pounds. Now, that can be tough if it's like a flat course, windy. Yeah. But at the same time, being 135 pounds, as long as you know, you, you've, you're doing some sort of... Uh, training to make yourself a robust person in general, that can really help on the run. Mm -hmm. If you're like a 215 pound person and you're doing oh, yeah. running, that's that's really rough on your body. So that could be helpful. And then outside of that too, I, I look at this and I see like a lot of room for improvement with FTP too. So it's like, it'd be one thing if your, 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 your power to weight ratio just put you in a spot that it wasn't very good and there probably wasn't a lot of room for improvement. But being mm -hmm. having a 510 frame, and I, I think that there's probably some room for... There's a lot of room for growth. Well, and this is one of the really fun things about being new to a sport is you make huge gains. Yeah. You get to make huge gains, and it's super fun, and it's really motivating. So keep in mind that where you are now, I mean, you are still relatively new to this, so you're going to continue to make some really significant gains. And then the further you get, the better you get, the harder it is to make the gains. So really enjoy this for a while. Yeah. Um, and I would also say there's a lot that can be gained technique-wise. So working on your transitions, swimming is huge on technique. So you can make really big gains working on your swim technique. Uh, one of the big things, and I'll just say this as a former swimmer, is uh, being in the water is such a foreign environment to our brains. It's it's just if your, your brain is like automatically goes into like we're drowning and we're about to die mode. Yeah. And that's really hard to it makes it really hard to focus on technique when so much of your cognitive uh, capacity is devoted to not dying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's how I still feel. <laughs> so, so just taking the time to get really comfortable in the water, get comfortable, you know, breathing with your face in the water, especially knowing that in a triathlon, the swim can be pretty hectic. So really getting on top of that and working on that can, I think you can make really big gains on that front too. Are you paying I, attention? Uh, yeah. I, I was actually just going to say, <laughs> I already asked Amber to be my swim coach. So <laughs> it's going to be really helpful. But some, some other things with this too, like you said on execution or basically like technique, mm -hmm. like oh, execution is yeah. huge. And oh you can gosh. see athletes that let's say they are really fast, but they're injured or they're coming off an injury mm -hmm. or they have some big limiter, but they just know how to execute so well. And really a big part of that is nutrition. Yeah. They know how to fuel really well. And as a result, they can still kind of like, 
I don't want to say fake it because they've fully earned it, but they can they can get by and do better perhaps than their numbers would would suggest they would. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. If if in this case, uh, Ben, if you were doing Xbox and then like you were competing with that sort of thing, I find that a lot of the time those sort of people are good at paying attention to details mm -hmm. because they, you know, whether it's like leveling up in some way or doing something like that. Yeah. And as a result, you may have a lot of like advantage actually on somebody that's just like I just you know, I just put in the K's and I just push really hard on my pedals and I just hope it works out. Right. So it's all about execution on the day. So the numbers are really helpful in tracking your pro progression and giving yourself an idea of where you might be, but it's all about who does what relative to one another on the day. Mm -hmm. And I mean, logistics play a huge, huge, huge role in that. Yeah. I, it, like transitions and everything else. I'm, I've, that's like, there's, I've transitions I, are small. In the I, race. I know they are, but for me, it's like a gigantic, like unknown. You should only focus on transitions. <laughs> uh, but okay. planning your travel and your nutrition. I mean, those are, yeah. those are really, really key. And that can really help on the day and the equipment that you'll use based mm -hmm. on all that. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole thing. I asked this question in the forum and, uh, guys, I have got, I've got a big triathlon background, right? Yes. Like, uh, I understand it's not all about watt per kg or all about sure. your open marathon time, but with certain watt per kgs and certain open marathon times, you're not going to qualify. Yeah, so if your yes. PR is like a four and a half hour marathon, you're never going to qualify for Kona with that. If with that's that. your current fitness level. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but there's also not a magic number. And it's all about sure, running up right. the bike and pacing and execution, but it is a good like litmus test for this. So for Ben, here's what I would go about doing it. I think if you hit four watts per kilo, you can definitely qualify mm -hmm. either through being super aero or a hilly course mm -hmm. um, at four watts per kilo at 135 and then running um, that same level. You're, you're in a tough age group at 30 to 35. It's fast. But if you could do a three hour open marathon, like, and then you can combine everything together or even a 310, if you can then combine that. Uh, you totally have a shot, and depending on the day. Um, but if you're doing four-hour marathon, what, 3.4 watts per kilo, mm -hmm. it's going to be tough. But also, it's it's always based on who shows up. Some people just show up to a lot of races, or you travel. There's a – I forgot the name of the website. Someone put it in the forum, but they, like, analyze what the slowest races are. Yeah. Which I think then the next year, it's, like, the fastest race because <laughs> yeah. everyone, like, goes to it. But <laughs> right. there's probably data on that too. Yeah. But you can compete in some – you can fly around the world and find races that are not as competitive. Yeah. Some of the local, some of the European ones and some of the U.S. ones that are very popular are super competitive. That can be a good chance to kind of give back to your family, too. I don't know if you have a family in this case, but like training for something like that takes you away from your family a lot. And if you do pick a cool place, something like that, bring the family and then spend some time afterward on vacation yeah. with them, you know, like because that's <clears throat> that's that's challenging putting in the and in. one last point that I want to make to hopefully give some cyclists some perspective on this. Uh, a friend of mine who's a very fast runner, a uh, very fast runner, she was talking about how, like, uh, she watched Kona, the broadcast of Kona that they had just recently on, I think it was NBC or whatever it is. And she was looking at the running form, and I was, I, and I asked her, I was like, yeah, like, did you see, like, Sanders' technique, or did you see, like, this person's technique? And she was like, yeah, I don't know how all of them look so good. And it was kind of funny because I was expecting her being, like, a running aficionado. I expected, like, the opposite. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it's really interesting to see because from her mind, she's like, I don't know how they run with all of that on their body and still maintain technique, which is why like an athlete like Anna Haug or something like that is so impressive <clears throat> that they can maintain such good technique while doing that. So like it, a lot of the time, like you may be a really good triathlete just because you're robust enough so that you can run well off of the bike and everything else. It's like a, almost like a unique discipline. Yeah, you, you, uh, what does it say? You don't break down as much as other people. Yes. Mm -hmm. So therefore, like your, your open times don't have to be as fast. Right. Or your, your watt per kg. Exactly. You're durable. Yep. You may have a slower open marathon time, but you may beat that person once you get into it because you're durable. Yeah. So, and I'm not durable actually. So this has been proven in many ways. So it could be with the knees and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of injury. So this could be bad, but we'll see. Hopefully <laughs> not. <laughs> Nate's, Nate's shaking it. Why are you shaking your head? You, play, you do like uh, like single track six. You're fine. Day over day, like, I don't know. Yeah, that's a big day. So <laughs> that's a big day. Uh, who do you think Amber is going to be fastest between the three of us in triathlon? In triathlon. Ooh, I don't know. Overall fastest will be John. You think so? Yes, dude. Oh, you're just as fast time trialing as us, and then the run you will destroy us. Mm. And there's not enough. The swim is not long enough unless you drown. <laughs> but the swim is not long enough be great, to yeah. make up for the run. <laughs> you're, on, a, on a marathon, you're probably beating by 30 minutes. Ooh, that's really, I don't know. 
I have faith in you. Okay. <laughs> Here's the real question. Who's faster than Chad or I? Not age group, just overall. Mm. The correct answer is me. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I know Chad runs, actually. Like, you know, for, for like just he runs pretty regularly for keeping up on training. I just don't know. I don't know if Chad's ever done a – I'm sure he's done a running race. I've just never heard of it, so I don't know if he's fast. I used to do rap ones. Yeah, that's right. So I don't know. I don't know. Chad might be really fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me in a couple months when I know everybody a little bit better. Yeah, right. yeah. This is like the, the pre- podcast listeners. I apologize. You're probably going to get sick of hearing this until 2022 when we actually do triathlon. But I, this is like exciting to think about. So, people, somebody right now is listening to this, and the triathlons have already happened. Yeah, and they're just like, how do those people doubt Nate beating Chad? <laughs> <laughs> what, what were they thinking? Oh man, clairvoyant Nate. <laughs> my my FTP is slightly higher than his right uh, now. Yeah, your FTP is a lot higher than his. Mm-hmm. A lot higher than his. I think that the biggest thing that I've seen other people say is that they think that you're gonna. And this is, I disagree with this. By the way, people think that you're gonna blow it on like strategy and go too hard on the bike. I've done but so many. You're like the most measured and calculated person. So then other people say that Nate's going to like overthink it, but I don't think that you can't catch and a this, break. And yeah, no, I know, right? Seriously. But seriously. <laughs> people are harsh on all of it, but really on Nate, they're really harsh. But then uh, people think you'll overthink it, but I don't, so I don't see how that would hurt. I also don't think that you overthink things to that degree. So I, how would it hurt? I do other races like Leadville. I thought that out and I did well. Yeah. So uh, you blew up and you did well. Yeah. So like <laughs> on yeah. a tough day. Yeah. Yeah. On a way tougher day than, than our day. So, okay. Jason's question says, I listen to your podcast every week. It provides a good insight into the current scientific literature on nutrition and training. Thanks, Jason. We strive to be a reliable source on that. So following on the conversation from previous podcasts concerning nutrition and feeding on and off the bike, do you advocate for nutrition? And he's mentioning carbs of 40 to 130 grams an hour. So some t- somewhere, that's a huge range, but somewhere within that range. While training indoors, and he mentions following a plan, for, and that's an important detail, for rides of an hour or less. Thanks from, he says, British J. <laughs> and he also says, P.S. I'm currently on Sweet Spot Mid Volume 2. Excuse me. And have used your plan to get me through multiple endurance mountain bike races, such as Leadville. So. Right on. Uh, this is a, a, a I guess a, the answer depends, right, on on what's really going on. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Amber? <clears throat> I would, I would, if it's hard to say a general statement, right, because I don't know what somebody's doing in an hour. I would say chances are, if you're doing indoor training, you're doing relatively high intensity on during might that be. hour. Like mm-hmm. you're not just going to go noodle around on the trainer for an hour. It's not that likely, oh, um, you but you might. Yeah. And if you do, it's probably less important. I'm just a really big fan of looking at everything that you do as building a habit. So is this a habit that you want to build? Is this a habit that would serve you on race day? Is this a habit that would serve your performance over the course of a full season of training? And for me, fueling is, it should be, it should be habitual. Um, on race day, we talk, I don't know if you guys have talked about decision-making fatigue, but it mm-hmm. does take cognitive load mm-hmm. to think about and make a decision. And so when the more good things, uh, the more, um, the more things that you can do in your training and turn them into habits that, so that they just happen on autopilot and you don't actually have to make a conscious decision, the better, cause that saves you energy on race day. So I, I just really like to look at things from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, so from that perspective, I would say, yeah, just eat every time. And you're also training your GI system to be able yes. to handle carbohydrate, which is what you're going to want on race day. So it's not only from a cognitive and mental perspective, but also from a physiological one. Yeah. You can't just expect to show up on race day and suddenly fuel with a hundred grams of carbs an hour and be okay. Like it's going to, mm-hmm. you, you have to train your system. Uh, people are typing furiously right now. <laughs> you don't have to no. sure. do it for an hour workout. You don't have to. No, no. Um, you won't die. Couple Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's how I think of it. One, if it's high intensity, there could be a benefit. There's like a study showing that just swishing something mm-hmm. sweet in your mouth mm-hmm. helps. Yep. Um, so you could have increased performance. Um, and sweet... and, sorry, can I mention something on that? Increased performance means potential for increased improvement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because basically, once again, you don't just eat to avoid bonking. You eat to improve your performance. And if you can do more in that workout, or and really it's not more than the workout requires, but hit it with more precision, then you'll be getting more benefit. Or uh, you do the same workout and with carbohydrate, the RP is lower. Right. Mm-hmm. That is huge. Like huge. Uh, we talked about this, I think last podcast, if all your workouts have lower RP, you're probably more likely to be consistent mm-hmm. um, or you can do more work. Like mm-hmm. we talked about. And you'll feel more confident on race day. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah for sure. For sure. Um, two, depending on 
depending on how your workouts or how much volume you're doing, and I think mid volume, I'll probably be doing stuff every single time. I'm a big carb fan. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, <laughs> really? <if> you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, if you're doing the high volume plan, it's like a six day stage rate. It's like really like a, almost like a grand tour. Because you're like doing four weeks or six weeks of For training. For us amateurs. Yeah. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And it's two almost two hours every day. And the easy days are like the easy days in the, in the grand tour. But you're, fe you're fueling that day to be able to like hit that next three day block. Yes. And yeah. I was like, I'm, you know, I'm, I've talked about it, but I want to do some cat two stage races and the volume over three days in a cat two stage race is less than like the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of sweet spot base high volume two, mm -hmm. which is good for my stage race. Yep. But you, you would think then, oh, Wednesday's a little bit easier. I'm going to like lose some body fat. I'm not going to eat so much, but then you have so much more to look at and do. So if you have any problems with maintaining the volume over like your plan and you start to burn out. I mean, I would look at nutrition, nutrition. and recovery. What, yeah. what do you think, Amber? For sure. Yeah, the fueling is huge. It makes such a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's, it's you know, a lot of people look at this like, oh, you're counting calories and you want to get to a certain body composition. But I just go back to your body knows best. Give your body, you know, the fuel that it needs to do, to perform the, you know, to perform the way you want to perform. And again, one good day leads to a good week, leads to several good months. Mm -hmm. And it, your mood, nutrition influences your mood. It influences your confidence. It influences your RPE. It influences your ability to actually put out work. So it's not just um, calories in, calories out, mm -hmm. you know, from that perspective. Like there's a lot of benefit to fueling appropriately that doesn't just have to do with how much, how many calories you're actually burning. Mm -hmm. If you're overall, let's say you're obese and you're doing a three times per week, maybe mm -hmm. you could get away with that. And mm -hmm. it's a way to... Um, but even that though, I would just, if you can do I, more work, you're probably going to, I would still feel during and then just eat less better. the rest of the time Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, just to make those workouts a little easier. Cause making your workouts harder is just, it's just like you're setting yourself up for long-term failure. Yes. Um, I think that's a big, rough. one of the biggest differences you see between riders that are really, they're, they're good riders, good racers. They have a lot of experience is that they fuel during their workouts more than the rest. Yeah. Then I find that the rest, what they do is they feel before and after their workouts more. Tell your rest day Keegan story. Yeah. Three, yeah. Three. yeah. So like I brought it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, he was basically thinking of like, the, so a lot, a big question that we get is somebody says like on rest days, like I don't want to eat that much cause I'm not doing as much. And he was like, how, like I would, you can't afford to not do that. Like you have to eat during your rest day because the next day is, is even more important. Like. Why in the world would you cheat yourself with a salad on a rest day? <laughs> like, because the next day, if you eat now, you're going to be able to do more work. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, you know, he's like, he's, he's the, high volume. He's the, yeah, he's the best mountain biker there is in the country right now. Right. So, but at the same time, when you look at that, <clears throat> there is a principle to be learned and it's that most of us tend to split hairs when once again, like you talked about talking about mowing the grass on the mountain, we have to worry about the mountain itself. Right. And we can do very other, uh, like very different things and get much more benefit. So for me, if it's a rest day, uh, I, I don't taper off and eat less unless for some reason I'm going to have, you know, seven days off after that. I'm not mm -hmm. going to be training yeah. something like that. If you're on low volume and three sure. days a week, it could, it could change what you're, you're doing. Cause you have multiple rest days in a row. Sure. But I just did a recovery week and during that recovery week, it's so hard, right? Cause you're like, I'm not training as much. I can't eat as mm -hmm. much, but I, I just put it in my head. I have to, I'm going to have a three week block where I'm going to each day, like probably be more and more behind. Yeah. At the end of my last block for high volume, I was tired at the end. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. I want to be less tired and I want to hit every single workout. Yeah. So, uh, maybe I gain a half a pound of fat or something, but sure. I think if I do all the workouts in my next block, that's going to come off and more. You'll be further ahead. I'll be further ahead. Yep. It, the, the one last point too, to, to cover with this is that when you're talking about, uh, having a huge chunk of time off, possibly having something like that. If you do have to do that and you're wondering how to go about it with nutrition and balancing, and I guess this even applies to something less, but take the energy that you would put and even the worrying negative energy mm -hmm. that you have that you would put into the training and everything else and just double that down into what you're eating in terms of the, the quality of what you're eating. Like yeah, if you do intense. have a week off like that and it's a recovery week, Maybe on that week, instead of worrying so much about you know how much you're eating, just worry about what you're eating and make sure that it's really high quality. That doesn't mean less. That usually ends up meaning you eat more. Like you'll probably feel more full, mm -hmm. um, but it's just because if you're eating instead of just a bunch of you know fries and stuff like that, you know it's kind of tough. So. Yeah, I think I said this before, but one of the rules of thumb that um, 
Dotsy Bausch used to say, and she's an Olympic silver medalist, by the way, cyclist, don't diet on the bike. If you need to, first of all, um, question the assumption of whether or not you actually do need to create a calorie deficit. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes it's not the case, but this is where it can be really handy to work with a nutritionist. Uh, the first time I started working with a nutritionist, I had really been worried about body composition and was really trying to create a big calorie deficit. And when he actually gave me the prescriptions for how prescriptions, by that I mean how many grams of protein and carbohydrate you should be getting per kilogram of body weight, I almost it was it was physically difficult for me to eat that much. I could not believe how much I was supposed to eat relative to what I was. And, and here I thought I was being, you know, the good disciplined athlete. So um, and honestly, like it, it did wonders for my body composition. Um, so so really, sometimes that assumption is not always correct. And it's better. You're better off questioning that with somebody who really knows what they're talking about. So that's the first question to ask yourself is, you know, is this something that I actually really need to be worrying about? Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is um, if you do get to a point where you do need to create a calorie deficit somewhere in the day, don't do it on the bike. So yeah. fuel your workout, you know, get, get enough before, get enough during, get enough after. And then if you need to create a calorie deficit somewhere else in the day, what happened to your performance after you did have that, like increased carbs and in the right. It was amazing. I mean, my recovery improved, my mood improved, um, which, and, and certainly my power output went up for sure. Yeah. So when you say you, uh, your body composition improved too, is that because you could then do more volume or more like intensity during the volume? I think honestly, it's, I, I don't know the answer to the question, but the way that I think about it is my body's really smart. My body is, you know, there's so many different physiological feedback loops going at the same time in our bodies. It's really impossible for us to like sit down mm -hmm. and conceptualize what's happening, but your body is constantly optimizing mm -hmm. for what you're doing for the stresses, you know, it's constantly optimizing and adapting to the stresses that you're putting it under. And it can only do that with the fuel that you're giving it. So once I started giving my body enough fuel, it was able to optimize in a way that it wasn't able to before then. So I just like, I like the idea. It's like, give your body everything it needs to optimize for you. Cause it's going to do a way better job than you will. <laughs> this is uh, you've, you said this a few times off the air to me and about who athletes like chase, like a look for their body. Yes. And I've, I have the same thing. I'm like, I, I look at fast cyclists and I'm like, man, they have uh, veins like in their quads. Mm -hmm. I need veins in my quads. Right. I need to look that way to be that yes. way. Exactly. And then I do things that then sabotages mm -hmm. my whole, like all my training. And then I like stagnate. Can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah. yeah I, this is, you know, we all kind of have a stereotypical image of what we think the, the, the perfect body type would be for a specific sport. And then when your own body doesn't look like that, you feel like you should constantly be chasing that. But the truth of the matter is, your optimal triathlon body or my optimal cycling body might not look the way you think that, you know, stereotypical image should look. Mm -hmm. And so disengaging from that, stop thinking about how your body should look, just give your body what it needs, do the training, allow your body to adapt to it because you're chasing the, you're chasing the physiological adaptations, which aren't necessarily going to translate to a particular look. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just trust your own body. Trust your own body. It, it, it knows better than, than anyone and anything yeah. <laughs> what yeah. it needs. And your body is different from everyone else's. So somebody else's optimal body type for cycling, for triathlon is going to be way different than yours. Um, the last thing I have to say, because again, people are typing furiously. We know about fasted workouts and there might be some benefit to, or there, there is some benefit to uh, how you will burn more fat with less carbs in a fasted state on mm -hmm. that. But our opinion is, again, there's so much low hanging fruit, unless you are a at least my, I think we've all agreed on this. Um, actually, I'm gonna talk to Amber about this, but unless you are a, you're to this point where you can't add more volume, um, you're executing your intensity there and you're recovering well, then add that in. But yeah. there's like, there's the whole, like, if you can just add more volume in general, that's probably going to make you faster or you can have, you know, the right amount of intensity per week, but don't do the fasted workout that then um, takes away from your intensity and quality the next day. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. so that's, it's like a, it's a, it's a last thing to add on rather than like my foundation of my training is going to be fasted workouts. Um, mm -hmm. thus other workouts suffer. Yeah. yeah. Chase the performance first, chase yeah. the performance first. Cause that's, that's really where you're just going to get, you're going to make the most gains. And the other thing I just want to mention briefly, we don't need to do a deep dive on this, but fasting has a really, really different effect on women's physiology than it does on men's. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough one too. So, um, I think it's a lot harder on women's bodies and we don't get the same types of beneficial adaptations that men do. Um, 
it's not a huge difference, but I think it's enough that it's worth mentioning. Yeah. So um, again, I'll reference Stacey Sims' book, Roar. It's really good. Uh, it does a deep dive on that if you're interested. Cool. Tucker, can you put that in there? Oh, he's already doing it. He's a one click faster <laughs> so than me. So good. Uh, Dimitri says, hi, coaches. First of all, five stars on the podcast. It has been so amazing to follow you on your journey over the years with everyone challenging their limitations to an astonishing degree. To my question, I'm currently trying to grow my FTP as large as possible over the winter months. Sorry, one second. Just got. Oh, there we go. Um, without worrying about, about weight too much. It, there is a lot of information on your podcast, but I believe some recurring concepts do not help with that goal. For example, not feeling for rides less than 90 minutes. We just squashed that one. Or heat, <laughs> or heat acclimation training, right? <clears throat> so he says, with all the new knowledge, and, and the reason that heat acclimation training is tough is because you're simply not capable of doing as much work. Mm -hmm. Since you're not capable of doing as much work, it's tougher to move the needle, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why that works. <clears throat> but once again, if you're getting to the point where you need to split hairs or very specific things, that's when you start to bring it in. Okay. With all the new knowledge you have gained over the last years, could you walk us through all the ingredients that go into fully maximizing the effects of a workout on a given day? With the sole goal of growing FTP, for example, sleep, should it be eight hours or above? Then he mentions pre-workout fueling, following the structure on the bike, backpedaling instead of quitting in the middle of an interval, for example. Optimal cooling for maximal output on the bike fueling, music to lower RPE, recovery, nutrition, when to start ideally, and what sort of composition should you have of that minimizing stress, feeling that for the next workout and so on. He says, I know everyone's different, but I believe uh, it would be nice for all users to have a neat overview of all the factors that could help maximizing training adaptation. So Nate, uh, this split is, hairs. Yes. <laughs> and then we're going to get into really his, his a race goal is, uh, to, he, he wants to race, uh, get level game, which is like the, but the, the Fondo version, so to speak of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's not actually like, you know, He's not going to be slugging it away with the top uh, pros there, but, and he wants to do well in that race. So we'll kind of apply that context. But with that in mind, do you want to just run through the different things that he listed? Sure. Uh, do you want to go first, Amber? You want me to do it? We can go talk. for it. Okay. I'll do mine first. Okay. <laughs> sleep. Yeah. Uh, pretty crazy. So again, yeah, a good night's sleep is very important. It's not just the amount of time, but the quality of the sleep, the awakenings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, when I forgot my sleep mask when we were in Lake Tahoe and I woke up so many times, plus it was a different environment or different bed. I don't know how pros do it when you travel. Like it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Um, That's why sky brings their own beds and pillows yeah. and everything. else. And we had alcohol, which didn't help. <laughs> and I drink a lot of coffee too late in the day, which also does not help. Yeah. Um, so I do a sleep mask, earplugs, CPAP machine with sleep apnea, yeah. tape my mouth, weighted blanket, and then Uller. I got the Uller thing, which it's, is like a cooling pad below. I'm sure you don't want to share like a, a, a definitive thing, but it's not. Sure. It's not definitive. I've they didn't give me any money. It's really expensive, but I love it. Yeah, you, so I'll far like, you're liking it. Uh, yeah. yeah, I got. I haven't figured out the exact temperature, yeah. right? But I love it. Cool. Um, okay, so that's sleeping. Um, Pre-workout fueling. Uh, that to me starts the next day after the last workout, mm -hmm. right? Or you could even say during that workout, right? Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's say I've, I'm just carb centric and I'm eating all this stuff and I'm, I'm to the, I agree with Amber that my best days are when I'm eating, um, nutrient dense food and I'm stuffing myself mm -hmm. and my body. And when I do it, when I focus on nutrient dense food and not like French fries and Popeyes, mm -hmm. like my body composition usually improves mm -hmm. for your meals, your, your meals that aren't around your training. Yeah, yeah, not not right. Like okay. During my just training. want to clarify no, that yeah. no kale salads. Yeah, on you're the not bike. eating a kale salad right before your workout. No, no, no. Um, and then for that, uh, I I do try to do meals in like three hour, three to four hour things. So if I have at least three to four hours before I ride, so I'm gonna ride at noon. I have that early like what eight a.m. Real high carb, mm -hmm. one to two hundred grams of carbs in my meal. I'm also bigger at 192 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, if I get that within like 90 minutes, I get a hypoglycemic like rebound and it can be really hard to even do like a Pettit or a Baxter for me. Mm -hmm. But if I do three hours, that's great. Um, if I really want to do something crazy, I'll do like sometimes like beat it, like nitrate. That's yeah. usually done for races. It's like um, beet juice. Like a yep. beet shot. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then um, before I usually do a gel and SAS gel like 15 minutes before. Mm -hmm. Then on the bike, I'm doing... 100 grams of carbs per hour with one bottle. It's a liter bottle. And I try to do that per hour. And that's a um, two to one ratio between glucose and fructose. And then I have another bottle of uh, 
Uh, precision hydration, they're 1500 and that's got like 60 calories of probably, I don't know what it mixes, but probably glucose. No, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, I drink that too. The internet knows for sure. So I yeah. do like almost two liters of water per hour. It's, um, a, it's a lot. I know. But the thing is, yeah. You, and then I helps. got the, I got two huge fans, uh, the Lasco fans and yeah. they blow so much. Like it's amazing. Yeah. It's crazy. And then I have a playlist that I do, um, and I, if it's an easier workout, I can do uh, just like random Spotify stuff. But this is the same playlist every time. And Spotify is like your interview things. All I do is listen to Red Hot Chili Peppers <laughs> and, and stuff. Yeah. Um, I can't listen to that any time other than working out. Yeah. Um, I also will do, depending on the time of day, I'll do caffeine. So uh, these are like, these are all things to lower your RP. But mm-hmm. if I'm going to drink coffee anyways, I might as well time it mm-hmm. pretty close to my workout. And it does not impact me to drink. I can even drink coffee on the bike and I'm fine and mm-hmm. i don't get acid reflux mm-hmm. um and then what's i guess is that anything oh yeah and then i watch uh i'll watch like muted on my ipad um youtube videos of racing mm-hmm. sometimes it's my personal race mm-hmm. although that can be kind of like annoying <laughs> depends on how well i did uh i'll watch like jeff linder from norcal cycling yep. some of his stuff and yep. even his stuff without the commentary on jeff i wish you would put out full race cover things like yeah. that'd be really cool yeah but watching the first person of crits I like that. I don't have mm-hmm. to really pay attention. Um, yeah, and then during longer rests, I'll switch to like a, a movie um, because I like, these are all for intense stuff. I like the switch between, it's like rest. Oh, now it's rest time. And then it stops and I get the loud music in and now it's go time mm-hmm. and that, that brain switch. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, I just started, I've been messing with recovery shakes, but I'm gonna, based on what we actually talked about here, I'm gonna try doing more recovery shakes right afterwards based on what Amber said too. And it's a 20 grams of whey and 100 grams of carbs. Mm-hmm. I know that's way more than anyone ever it's does. Ratio, yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I like to go to the extreme, I'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. um, go there, figure it out. Then worst case is I probably am not as hungry later on in the day. <laughs> right? Terrible, right? Uh, I mean, that's, I mean, that's no, I, I, and maybe joking. I get, actually worst case is probably like diarrhea. Um, sure. Yeah, because your gut wouldn't be able to process all of it. Yeah, exactly. But I think I'll be able to. So that yeah. is all the things I'm trying to think about. If I remember anything, I'll jump in. Amber, what do you have to add to that? That was quite quite a quite a list. That's a lot. Um, I want to step back real quick and just go back to the concept of building good habits. So yeah. there's a lot that you can do to optimize your training. There's a lot you can do to optimize increasing your FTP. I just want to – we can get into this in a second. But there's a lot more that goes into performance than – fitness. So FTP is, is awesome, but there's also positioning. There's also skills. There's also planning mm-hmm. your logistics, um, making sure that your, your travel is going to go smooth. So there's, there's a lot of other peripheral things that can go into performance for an event. So backing out of that, if we're just looking at your training and your preparation and what you can do for your training, there's a lot that you can do and you can really get into the weeds with this, but thinking of this as building habits, Creating a new habit is hard to do. It requires a lot of cognitive load, a lot of decision making, um, as does breaking bad habits. So when you kind of look through a list of things like this that you think that you could do, it's nice to try to choose one that might be like a keystone habit. So I was trying to think of a good example of this. And um, like if you want to start taking maybe like an iron supplement or, you know, I'm I'm not recommending that. But if there is something that you feel like would be beneficial to you, uh, getting really consistent with that might actually improve your hydration status. Right. Because if you're remembering to take that and you just say, okay, I'm always going to take this with a liter of water. Um, then maybe that's going to treat, so that's, that could be like a keystone habit, right? So Mm -hmm. you're trying to remember to take your supplement, but then that's also translating to a better hydration status. Other things attached to it, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So looking for keystone habits, those are a good place to start. And what I recommend is like, if you're going to make a change, make one change at a time, like make the change for a month, at least two weeks, but up to a month. And then that then becomes a habit and then you can change the next thing. So if you can find a couple of keystone habits to start, that's probably a good way to do it because you're more likely to stick with that. It'll actually become a habit. And then just remember that to build a new habit, it requires three things. You need to have a trigger. So something that's going to remind you, uh, then you're going to have a behavior. It's good. So the trigger will remind you to do the thing. And then you do the thing, there's a reward. Mm -hmm. Um, So the other thing you can do is identify bad habits. So what are some of your current bad habits that instead of adding in a new habit, is there a bad habit that you could eliminate? And maybe there's a keystone bad habit that, you know, by eliminating something, um, 
my husband used to drink Diet Coke a lot of work, and he just liked to have something that wasn't water to sip on, that was caffeinated, that would help his his uh, focus. And we replaced it with iced tea. Mm-hmm. So he was more hydrated. He wasn't getting as much of the aspartame and all yeah. of that, but he was still getting some caffeine. It was less caffeine. So it was, re- you know, instead of just breaking the habit, it was replacing a bad one with a better one. And it had all of these peripheral benefits. Mm-hmm. So I really recommend kind of stepping back and looking at it more from that perspective. Yeah. I, I, this, this definitely isn't a question looking for a silver bullet. So if you're listening mm-hmm. to this and thinking like, well, this one big thing is what it did for me or like what did it for me. And we've constantly talked about or not constantly, but we've regularly mentioned consistency being the yes. main thing with your training, which really ties into all the habit building. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but really if you're looking for all the different things, I have nothing to add that you didn't have already, Nate. Um, mm-hmm. that was a comprehensive list. Let's get into his event. Get yeah. level game. Just yeah. some interesting points on that. <clears throat> Cause you've ridden over there, Amber. Yes. Uh, we have not, we have like dreams of going over there and riding those spring classics races. That would be really fun, but we haven't done it. So I guess, on those races, it's common when you see it in your mind to see bergs, guys, uh, guys and gals going up these climbs that are like steep, Very short, steep. relatively yeah. short. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then also seeing like big, long, flat stretches. But in talking to you, it sounds like there's also like a lot of accelerations because of like really tight 90 degree turns and farm yes. fields and stuff, right? There's a lot of turns. <clears throat> it's really interesting landscape out there. Um, it's 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 usually pretty exposed. And there's, there's a lot of turns and mm-hmm. you can go from a huge highway to turning, you know, 90 degree turn at high speed onto, it could be a cobbled climb or just a really narrow climb. But a lot of the climbs are uh, narrower than this desk. Yeah. So especially if you're in like a big Fondo situation, those kind of bottlenecks are really tough and, and getting into the right position to, to get to onto that hill can make a huge difference because if you get stuck behind the wrong people, they're actually going to have to unclip mm-hmm. and there's just, you know, then you have to You're unclip stuck. and then, you know, on those Hills, there's no getting back on and restarting until you walk your bike to the top and then go again. So, um, there's a lot of the technical skill and positioning that goes into this as well. Um, and then the cobbles are just, until you ride them, there's just no way to really describe them. I, I, I get kind of a kick out of when people hit like a rough patch of pavement. And they're like, oh, it's just like Perry Roubaix. It's like, no. It is for me. Don't ruin it in that moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that moment I am in Roubaix. Yeah. It's, it's really hard. I mean, it can be sometimes, especially if you're, you're really going hard on cobbles, um, holding the bars and being able to shift becomes actually really difficult and at times impossible. <laughs> it's funny so, how it's like such a small action, but it adds yeah, up. Yeah, just actually just being able to push that paddle, I, it gets really surprisingly difficult. Um, so mentally preparing for those types of things I think is important and, and working on the skills, the positioning skills, being comfortable in a big group, um, being able to identify where's a safe place to put your front wheel versus where's not, and then mm-hmm. knowing how to get yourself out of maybe kind of a sketchy place and into a more a safer place in the Peloton. Yeah. Studying the course, I really recommend get on Google Earth and, you know, look at the course map, look for tight turns, um, even just walking through the whole course on Google map, you'll see, oh, this is where we go from four lane highway to tiny side road. Uh-huh. This is where the cobble climbs are. So if you can, one of the things we used to do is we'd do stem tape. Uh-huh. So you would identify where are the most, uh, what places on the course are going to be the most selective. And then you would write down, okay, you'd have like a little symbol, you know, triangle for a climb or a little hash mark for cobbles. And then you would m- mark what, you know, where, what kilometer that was going to be coming at. So then when you're riding, you can look at your stem tape and say, okay, we're 35 K in, I've got five K to get in a position for the Mullenberg. And then boom, you know, you're just mentally prepared for that. So little things like that, I think can really help to on the day as far as performance. On that stem tape, how big do you make the riding? Because we've done it before. <laughs> John's made it and like you could not see it <laughs> and then a pushy on cobbles and like the last thing you want to do is like put your face onto your your top two. Wait a minute. <laughs> like trying to read it. Hold but, on guys, I got to check. But how how big would you guys make it? Pretty small. Really? Yeah. Just I mean we, eyes. Would, we we made big ones on the last time that we did it and it was amazing. Yeah. We went to like very bold riding and it and it helped. Yeah. Some people Bigger put stuff. it on their top tube. And yeah. that gives you more room. I was able to fit mine on the stem. I, I liked the stem better because I didn't have to like look as far down. Yeah. And then the other thing you can do is you can program in, if you have a cycling computer that has this capacity, you can yeah. program in little alerts and that can be really helpful too. Yeah. I like what the, 
one tricky thing with that, I've done that before, is I programmed it on distance, but then my GPS got off on distance. Oh, no. So then, like I was getting like everything alerted late instead of, yeah, it was, it was a pain. Um, one thing that Todd Sadow does from Epic Rides, event organizers, you should do this. He actually gives you temporary tattoos and they're pretty big. So it like covers your forearm. Oh, nice. And then that so... temporary tattoo gives you everything in terms of aid stations, climbs, all that stuff. Uh, that's a good idea. Do... That's really good. It's a really good idea. Or um, just use a Sharpie. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right. <laughs> um, it's just nice because it gives you like, I mean, it's like because it's the tattoo and it's printed, you can see like the aid station. You can see how long that climb is. You can see like all the information. Better there. option if you don't have it's good really handwriting. Not... Yeah. And yeah. It's really not it bad. You'll just get like sweaty. <laughs> oh, with, so like, bad. Just a mix. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> Obviously not great if you have arm warmers or something. (laughs) Yeah, if you have arm warmers, that's going to be tough, right, with that. But I think that's a good idea. What kind of tires would you ride in cobbles? Really big, squishy ones. Like how big? 28s, 30s, At least 28s. Yeah. At least 28s. Yeah. For average people, do you think, like in my opinion, I feel like average people should probably go bigger than what the pros do. Probably. Just Just, It's going to make for a better Make your life a little bit easier. Right. What about uh, bar tape? Do you double wrap? I think we had a, we're having it again. We had this. I, I told the story before. Um, I did do this one year going into Flanders, and I double wrapped my bar tape, and the mechanic got annoyed with me and undid it. And to be fair, the professional mechanics they have they have really tough jobs because they are yeah. I, they're having to take care of usually two three bikes per rider, and they have to make sure that every single bike is clean, every single bike is safe, every single bike is completely ready, and they are up until like three or four in the morning every night after an event. Um, and, and they have to be awake during the event in case something happens because they're usually... Tough job. Yeah, especially on women's teams, the the mechanic who's jumping from the car behind the race. So we always have a caravan of team cars that follow the race and your mechanic's in there and we, we call them a jumper because if you have a mechanical or a mishap in the race, they jump out of the car and come to you, fix it so that you can keep racing. So they have to do that during the day. And then as soon as the race is over, especially for the classics, you know, there's mud and grass and mm-hmm. the bikes are a disaster. And then they have to go home and clean everything and make sure it's all ready for the next day. So he was annoyed because he didn't want to have to have like one set of bikes that were double wrapped. <laughs> yeah. But to be fair, once I got on the race, y- you don't really want to be gripping so hard that a double wrap is really going to help. So I, yeah. I think it's a personal preference thing, but for me it was actually easier just to have a looser grip on the bars. And we kind of joked, it's like you want to hold the bars as if you were holding you the way that you would hold a potato chip and mm-hmm. not want it to break. So yeah. pretty light and loose on the bars. With um, the trick to that though is making sure you have your thumbs hooked so that your your arms your hands don't get knocked off the bars. So you don't want to just be setting on top here like this. You want to have at least a thumb hooked underneath and then hold nice and loose. Kind of float. Yeah, there's, exactly. There's a balance to be struck, right, with like padding because mm-hmm. too much padding you actually end up gripping harder because it's less precise and you have right. this disconnection, and, and then too little padding obviously and it's bad in the other way and i find that a lot of the time with mountain bikes i'll see people getting like more padded grips Mm -hmm. like a esi chunkies are a good example they're really thick padded grips and they'll get those really thick grips that are really squishy and then they end up getting arm pump and then they end up getting to the point where their hands are just so fatigued they they quit pulling their brakes and they need to they quit using their dropper post and they need to that sort of thing because their hands are so fatigued so you do have to kind of find a sweet spot and that's going to be individual for each person and probably change over time too yeah. but if you think it's something you might want i recommend getting there a little bit early mm-hmm. go ride the cobbles see what you think you know and you can yeah. make a decision a couple of days before the race it shouldn't be first time on race day Probably not. <laughs> I don't recommend that. <laughs> if but, we ever go there, that's probably exactly uh, what we're going to do. Oh, uh, yeah. I guess. <laughs> First day. We want drama. All Once in. the gun goes off. All in. Uh, the, uh, to, the, that mechanic thing, I, I, I was kind of like, I thought about it more, and it makes sense, because if the mechanic, if you have all the athletes come, and they're like, oh, they have different, like, I have a different pulley wheel, and they're this and that, and then the mechanic, it just makes the time longer. Yes. And even though bar tape was like no big deal, it's like the it's like the broken window in the city. Well, you let Amber have bar tape. Yeah. Why can't I do this? And why yeah. can't I do this? And then it goes and goes and goes. Mm-hmm. So the mechanic sees one difference and is like, we're not going to allow this because that will then everything Opens will change. Opens the floodgates. Yeah. And then yeah. everyone people might then not have their bikes ready in time. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then the whole team has problems. So yeah. I felt bad because I was like, why would the mechanic do that? It's just like next thing you know, no, like it's, punitive. It's really but it makes fair. sense. It's in very the long fair. Run. Yeah. Next thing you know, team team members are just bringing their own bikes that aren't even the same brand. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, yeah. I don't like it's, it. It's electrical tape. It's fine. <laughs> you have <better laughs> bar tape. So here's yeah. my bike. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andrew's question. I'm an Aussie rider and love your podcast. Definitely five star coaching advice. Thanks, Andrew. 
It says, thanks for all the work you put in. I recommend the podcast to all of the guys I ride with, hopefully to the gals too. It says, here in Australia, we mostly have handicap races. I normally start off at a six-minute handicap by myself at my local races, depending on the quality of the scratch group. So we're going to describe – actually, do you want to describe handicap racing first because that might help people? Sure. This is uh, – I had to ask on the forum because mm-hmm. I didn't realize. And I'm going to mm-hmm. be in one, though, in March. Yeah. Um, they do it to, like, kind of make it so all races aren't so much of a, like, uh, group – sprint group sprint and they start uh, riders at different times so riders are graded by the state and i know heffron park's a little different but people will... that's where you're going to be riding sorry that's why yep. right yeah um and uh it's kind of like race categories sometimes it's one through ten and then they let people off at different times and then uh you try to chase the people ahead of time so yeah. if the person who gets off first who is the slowest crosses the finish line first they win yeah so let's step back really quick they in what order from fastest to slowest do they they go from slowest these? to f- fastest so that means like the d grade would go first then the c grade then the b grade then the a grade so the fastest people are the ones that are starting last and they could very well catch and pass through a group in the middle of this race and now the crazy thing is is you can latch on to groups so if you're a, in b grade and somebody from a grade catches or the, the a grade group catches you you can just hold right on yep when and this is different in many cases because in road racing you get neutralized when yeah. another group yeah. comes through that's a big no-no mm-hmm. that happened when you're in one of my races there was a crash and my group latched onto a faster group yeah and i got caught behind the crash and i chased for 20 minutes while they're in the group yeah. i was kind of upset yeah i was like what, what are you doing and then they yeah. somebody had to like in luckily someone in the group was like guys we can't do this we're just floating around yeah. um but of course, they didn't do that until after I, I had just caught on, and then they're like, "Okay, now it's time to slow down." <laughs> <laughs> Convenient. Yep. So, so that's it's so that's how this racing works. Slowest starts first, fastest starts last, and they're separated by not necessarily a uniform amount of time. That's up to the race organizer to decide that. Yep. So, um, so that's the concept here. He says, I normally start off a, at a six-minute handicap by myself at my local races, depending on the quality of the scratch group. Sometimes I can spend the whole race by myself and have won races this way. So in this case, he's, he would be like the example of the D or the C grade probably, um, but he's been able to make it stick, which is pretty cool, yeah. even that he's riding by himself, which is really cool. Uh, he says, problem is, if I'm trying to stay in front, I've burnt my, all my matches, and if the scratch bunch catches me, the question is, what's the best strategy with that, right? And the scratch group is the fastest group. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it says, my question is about handicap race strategy. Am I better to try to time trial the race, spending a lot of energy to try and get a good gap early, then hold it? Or am I better to just soft pedal the first 20 minutes, saving my legs for when the scratch group, scratch bunch inevitably catch me, then try to hang on with them? I've tried this and I'm able to hang on with them for the fir- or for the rest of the race, but don't have the sprint to mix it in or to mix it up at the end. Love your race strategy insights, but haven't heard anything specific to handicapped racing, so would love your advice. Yeah, and we don't have handicapped racing, at least that I know of here in the United States. This, Amber, sure this sounds to me as like when to commit to a breakaway. Yeah. It's like yeah. the same principle. Yeah, exactly. same exact principle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, and when you're not a sprinter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's like you're being you're being dropped into the breakaway from the start. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, exactly it. Just yep. ready to go. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so so guess, what, do you, what do you think? Yep. Well... My philosophy in racing was always race forward. So if you have a time advantage, just do everything that you can to keep it. On the other hand, it's not always going to work out. And you just mentally, it's like, sometimes you just have to like mentally hit restart in the race. Even if physiologically you've burned a lot of matches, if you can just mentally be like, okay, that's all done. And now this is my new race. And it's it's hard to do because you're tired. But I think sometimes um, if you allow, I don't know, if you mentally allow yourself that possibility, I think... People can recover better than they think they can. And you don't know what people in the group have been doing behind you either. Mm -hmm. So there's a good chance they're tired too, especially if they've organized a chase. Um, But I think your best bet is just jump back in and be really savvy about using your use of energy. What I've found usually in local races is that you'll kind of get a fix for what people do. Mm -hmm. And they'll kind of do that more or less every time. So like you'll kind of know that the main group will hold 26 miles an hour or whatever it is. So that can be kind of a good bearing because that's this is the tricky part. Usually if you're with the group and you break away from the group, you can establish on that day roughly what the group has been doing and then right. you'll kind of be able to know. But in this case, you don't. But maybe you do since it's probably the usual suspects every week are right. doing the same thing. Now, this goes against you. If you did make it stick and you were alone and you like stuck it out the whole time, 
they might not like that quite as much. And they're more right. likely to probably do some work to chase you down. Mm -hmm. So uh, nobody likes to lose to that one person getting away <laughs> like that. That's always like, man, like no one likes to lose period. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but you feel like if one person like bested all of us, that means that we really screwed up. That's mm -hmm. like what the brain says. Right. So it would be really tough to get away with this sort of tactic of just time trialing and making it stick on in any sort of a repetitive manner. <clears throat> like, well, and, and the, the gonna... handicapper should change the handicap because exactly. if you win every time, they're probably going to give you less of a handicap. Right. Hopefully they do. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's nice to win, but just makes for better racing. So Andrew says that sometimes you can stay away. So, if, I mean, if you can do, like yeah. if you say you went up front, do it. <laughs> yeah. But the other strategy, um, so you say you're not a sprinter. So if you're, let's say you are a sprinter and they put you six minutes up and you're like, I'm not going to stay away. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think the best strategy is to soft pedal grab onto the group, sit in, and sprint at the end. It's just like you get six extra minutes of rest compared to everyone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you are not a sprinter and you cannot time trial away, I think the best strategy is to soft pedal, get in the group, but then don't wait until the sprint. Like so many people wait until the sprint, they're not a sprinter. Don't do that. Try to jump people early before that 1K to go, 2K to go, something like that. Um, because if you're going to just get destroyed in the sprint, it doesn't make sense to wait for the sprint. Try something. Because mm -hmm. yeah. sometimes it just takes people to – look at each other and then you can get a, a, a win. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's pretty much, I want to step back one bit, one step yeah. from this. You should always be racing with a goal in mind. And if your goal is to <clears throat> win these races, find the best strategy to make it happen. <clears throat> Forgive me. But if your goal is not to necessarily win these races and they're inconsequential C races, then you should use this as an opportunity to test out one of the tactics yes. that you want to try. Yes. So like, uh, if you do want to win, sure, like like go for that and find the best one. But otherwise, all these races that are like you know, lower priority races, which I, I they, they may be, they may not be. But if they are lower priority races, this is when you throw everything at the wall and you get to see what sticks. Exactly. So just make sure you have a goal identified rather than because many times you kind of get stuck in this middle ground of wondering what the best thing to do is. Right. Really. Should I go? If you have a goal, go? it'll be pretty clear what you need to do. Yeah, I think it's especially if this is a race that you're doing over and over with the same group of people, you kind of know what everybody's going to do. Mix it up a little bit. See, you know, try to try to win from a breakaway. Try to win in a sprint. Try to win with a late race move. Um, see if you can entice somebody else to get into a breakaway with you. I think, first of all, it makes you unpredictable, which is great mm -hmm. strategically. Second thing is you're going to learn so much. And I think that um, especially trying to win – I mean. In any case, you'll learn positioning better. You'll learn something about your tactics, which um, in racing, the beauty of it is you never end up facing the exact same situation twice, but you start to distill out these general principles that can help you make decisions faster on the fly and you can develop a really good race intuition so you're not really actively making decisions. You can just react on intuition in a way that's going to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a really great opportunity to start developing that race intuition if you're, you know, and again... Maybe you're less likely to win in a sprint. Mm -hmm. Give it a shot. Why not? You yeah. might learn something. And maybe maybe you just say, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna keep trying to win in a sprint until I do. And every time you learn something, you get to apply it the next time. So I just think this is a really great learning opportunity. Yeah. I wish they had races like this here. It would be a lot of fun. It would be fun. Yeah. Um, another thing to think about is when you are – when you're on a solo breakaway or any breakaway, a lot of times it's not uh, your effort that does it. It's the field's response yeah. to your mm -hmm. effort. Yes. And sometimes with this, if they mess around for the first 15 minutes, you might that might be enough. We see it yeah. all the time in professional yeah. racing where the field kind of messes around. And, yeah. Um, or with NorCal racing, it's like the right teams are represented. So right. the field says, not going to chase. We're and then that breakaway is going to stick. Yeah, no you, can, you can think of racing tactics like a power ratio. So where is the power in the peloton? If you have three really, really strong teams, that's where most of the power is. But if all three of those teams have somebody up the road in a breakaway, suddenly all of that power just got neutralized, mm -hmm. right? Because not one of those three teams is going to chase their teammates down. So now where is the power dynamic? Are the riders in the breakaway the strongest in the field? If not... Maybe, you know, the strongest riders have been neutralized. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about, you know, where is the power in the field? If you're the rider in the breakaway and you look around and the two strongest teams aren't represented, represented, okay, all the power is back in the field again. And how much energy do you really want to expend in that breakaway? So it, mm -hmm. just thinking about, like, where is the power? Has it been neutralized or has it been activated, right? Mm -hmm. So if the two strongest teams aren't in the breakaway, that's a lot of power in the peloton and they're going to be motivated to work. Mm -hmm. Then again... They might be playing poker with each other like 
you go chase. No, you go chase. No, you go chase. <laughs> a lot of that too is like it's knowing the information, knowing the riders, but also right. knowing who's in the breakaway and who's in the field. Right. Um, we talked about it's legal in the U.S. to a couple years ago to have uh, race radios, mm -hmm. and we talked about going to Tour America's Dairyland, and Amber is going to be our director. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Yeah, and I, just getting information on splits, and two with Andrew, like if you're uh, this is another thing, just getting splits from the side. So if you're TT and you have a six minute gap. And you're going, and you hold six, you hold six, you hold six. Then it goes to five, to four, like sit up. Like yes. it's coming down. Mm -hmm. And that can be some rest. But if you don't know that information, or what it goes to six, to six and a half, to seven, like I would keep pushing. Yep. Um, right. If, it, it, if it's coming down and no one's organized, keep pushing. Yep. Yep. You know, if, if everybody's just, organized and it's coming down, eh, that's, yeah, that's I, a different situation. I want Amber on the radio saying like, hey, they're, they're chasing hard, like sit up, or at least mm -hmm. sit on the back of the breakaway. Don't, sure. don't put the most, the, uh, most of your energy out right now mm -hmm. let's get into amanda's question no oh no we got, we got one more e uh, oh yeah forgive me this is right <laughs> we need to we need to apply this to nate here uh you were going to race in australia at heffron park and they do this sort of format of racing but the the course itself is kind of unique because it's more or less like the width of a of a bike path small bike path because yeah. some bike paths are pretty large it goes wide and then short <clears throat> yeah yeah uh, so not very wide and then, and but it's surrounded by grass, which is nice instead of curbs and 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 other things that you could hit and get hurt on probably. Uh, but they do this sort of race. So you have whole packs of people passing through other packs of people. Yeah, it's on this narrow. It's path. like a pack of thirty of B grade getting passed by a pack of twenty of A grade going as fast as they can so they can't latch on on a curve on like again it's like two wires wide maybe mm -hmm. three wires wide. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, it looks pretty. <laughs> when you watch the first person video, it's pretty scary. So I think I'm able to race twice there. I'm trying to ask everyone, should I race A grade or B grade? I think 25 people responded about every single one of them told me to race B grade. Because <laughs> everyone thinks you're really <laughs> slow. Uh, I don't. So I'm racing A. <laughs> yeah, because this one honestly looks like it would be pretty good for you. It doesn't have a lot of elevation change. Uh, it's going to be a video. I don't nothing. I don't need to win. But I, no, I don't mean that you're going to win. But I'm talking about a course fitting a person. Like if this was like a hilly course. Maybe yeah, race C. B, B grade, yes, yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> but like in this case, the course looks relatively, it looks surgy and like open to wind and all that stuff, but it's not. That's good for me. Yeah, that's all good for you. But anyways, I want a, uh, we want to make a great video out of this. Mm -hmm. And let's say I win the B grade. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not I'm not saying I would, but if I did, people would just say, you sandbagger, right? Yes. If I get dropped from the A grade, all the Aussies are like, yes, I told you so. That's <laughs> yeah. a great video. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I do get dropped from the A grade, I could latch, latch on to the B grade. Sure. Um, people are saying I could do the B grade and then jump on to the A grade, but it still feels a little weird. Yeah. I mean, I could wait until that. But yeah. um, basically, if I do horrible in A grade, everyone gets great video. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's true. Yeah, right? So it's true. that's pretty much it. Yeah. And then if I would do well in the B grade, it wouldn't be as good of a video. I think Australians are actually just really fast. I know. Oh, so if you're racing the A grade, um, please, if you're on my wheel, just just open gaps all the time on corners <laughs> so everyone else and let everyone else fill those in. Do that like every time. Simple uh, request. Be, yeah, because I don't have any teammates, so everyone can be my teammate. <laughs> Uh, Amanda says, I'm a recreational cyclist. Never, I'm not, by the way, this is the last one Then we're going to cover some of the live questions you've submitted. So uh, stay tuned for those. I'm a recreational cyclist and I've never followed a formal training plan. Is there any hope of me ever climbing Haleakala? And it, which for those that don't know, it's a volcano on the island of Maui. It's about 10,000 feet tall and you go from sea level all the way up to 10,000 feet. So, and says, and if so, what would my training plan look like? I commute year round and ride one to two centuries a year. Last year, I took a fitness test at a physiology lab and my VO2 max scored at 45.5 millimoles per kilogram per minute, which they said was good for a 42 year old female. I could probably invest in a smart trainer or a power meter, but not both. And, uh, she shared actually, she's on Strava as she rides today, by the way. So you can follow her on there. And she says, so what do you think? And she says, PS, even though I don't race, I totally enjoy listening to your podcast. Uh, so first of all, yeah, a hundred percent. There's hope of you climbing Haleakala. Yes, definitely. Like, yeah, yes. for sure. Definitely. <clears throat> uh, Nate, you did it. Yep. And, uh, you have some tips. Yeah. So first, Amanda, watch this. Use plan builder. Yes. <laughs> Choose Fondo. Boom. Question done. Yes. Two about trainer or power meter um or did you say smart trainer or just smart trainer yeah, just for, or power meter so yeah. i mean if you can i'd rather have the power especially on this one so i would get a power meter and a 
uh, dumb trainer, sorry trainers, yeah. uh, mechanical trainer, <laughs> yep. um, if you had to choose one. But if you had to choose between a trainer, like no trainer on a power meter, I would do the smart trainer. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a better one because then you can use the power outside. And especially on this climb, uh, you can pace you can yourself. Pace it. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Maui Cycling, they do a ride. I believe it was every Tuesday, but just email them. They're a cycling shop. It's supported. It is amazing. The guy like actually ran next to me with a bottle so I didn't have to stop. Yeah. It's uh, good support. That's yeah. Awesome. And then before the gate, <clears throat> they didn't follow me after the gate, but he did. He was pulled over there and he gave me like the change of clothes because you're going to want that. And, um, uh, all new bottles and more food because you still have like, I don't know, 90 minutes to go after that or something, Yeah, uh, which was amazing. And this one doesn't have any sort of dirt or anything else. It's road to the top, Yep, uh, which is nice. So you don't have to worry about switching out wheels or something like that. It can, you know, when I did it, the weather plays a big factor into it. Yeah. Even the guy at Maui Sack was like, man, you had a horrible day. Yeah. But at the top, it was flat road. I was doing 380 watts and I was going four miles per hour. <laughs> The wind is intense. <laughs> up yes, there. it the was bad. <laughs> and also, like the, the it changes really quickly. Like it can just be sunny and then completely flip on you. I mean, actually, when I got back to the shop, he's like, "Weather's pretty good right now." <laughs> <laughs> it's like you jerk. Why would yeah. you say that? <laughs> I actually, I, I had intentions of doing it when I was in Maui this year, and and every day the it ended up being really crazy weather up there, except for the one day that I was in the morning. I was like. Nah, I'm not going to do it today. I'll do it another day, and that day was perfect. Um, but a couple of things, like I looked into a lot of details on this, and actually somebody that we had, you can look up his podcast episode, Mike Stanek, S-T-A-N-E-K. <clears throat> we interviewed him last year in 2018 at Kona when he was, uh, he was one of the athletes that we interviewed, and he had a really good day. So uh, he was on Maui at the same time we were riding together this year, and he went up on Haleakala, so we talked a lot about it and looked into a lot of details West Maui or West Maui Cycling, I think, is the name of the shop or Maui Cycling, whatever it's Maui Cycling. Maui Cycling. West Maui is uh, West Maui's on the, the far same. side. Yeah. Yeah, different one. So the Maui Cycling guys, I think they have like you can go online and they have a whole either one of them, they have a whole walkthrough on exactly what you need to know and it's really helpful. Nice. So that's a big thing because if you don't do the support, even though I would absolutely advocate for it. Yeah, it's like 100 bucks. just do it, especially because you're in Hawaii. And totally. When do you do it again? Yeah, so I would advocate for the support. If you don't do it, a couple of things to know, and they're all in online, which um, uh, producer Tucker may be able to find that, that article. If not, we'll add it in uh, after the fact. But uh, you definitely want to bring your change of clothes with you, or I should say a jacket, uh, definitely a wind jacket of sorts and something to be able to warm up. And then when you're talking about water, it kind of pays to camel your way through the lower portion, even though you're carrying more weight. And what I mean by that is uh, whether it's, you know, extra bottles that are in jersey pockets or anything else, because you'll get to like a general store that's, I think, around 4,000 feet up. But then after that, and I'm talking elevation, then after that, you don't have a whole lot of water stops. There's like a bathroom where you can fill it up. But sometimes that bathroom I've heard has been closed. So then you miss your water stop. So you really have to, to plan on that. So these big, long climbs like this, it's as, it's, it's as much a logistical challenge as it is anything else. And then one tip that I can say is on, at least for West Maui cycles, we rented an e-bike and it was like 250 bucks for a week uh, for awesome. my wife and I when we were there. These things are awesome. And that would be something if you have somebody with you that, that could help you, but they don't want to ride up there with you. Um, that could be a more enjoyable way for them to do it if they want. Um, I don't think an e-bike would last the whole time though. We could have taken the, we got the turbo Vado and if we kept it on low, which means that it probably would have assisted like 150 Watts or something like that. Uh, we could have taken it entirely around the West Maui loop. It would still be faster and less energy though than sure. going up the. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you could do, you could do quite a lot. A lot of it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it'd even be nice just to have a friend maybe in the low, in the final part, they could drive up there, then just ride the final section with you. So um, but yeah, this is like, uh, so I think that's kind of all, oh, there's another thing too. When you get to the top of Haleakala, they do a tourist thing where you can ride, you can rent a bike and ride it downhill, which sounds it's a mountain like, bike. yeah, um, which sounds like a terrible idea, um, going downhill, like with just random tourists that don't know, you know what they're doing, but, uh, they, people do that. Um, but if you're riding up and a lot of people, like when I was going up to the, at least a 4,000 foot point, they're like, oh, are you going to ride the bike down? And I'm like, I'm on a bike now. I don't know. <laughs> And I was confused. I thought that you actually had to ride it down. Like it was like a mandated thing by the park, but you don't. You can ride your own bike down, even though tourists are riding down. Just beware. Because I've heard that things get pretty sketchy with the tourists riding bikes no, down. I was riding up. It's a bunch of people in full face mountain bike helmets on a mountain bike who don't ride mountain bikes going wow. down like 
sustained like 10 percent <laughs> steep like, road yeah uh it is uh, I, I was pretty like, sketchy yeah it's sketchy yeah i have a secret hope of someday doing a downhill road camp where people just shuttle me up to the top of really fun descents yeah. and i get to ride yeah. down on my road It'd be bike. amazing right the problem with this one is it's so cold it's um, freezing up so there. i found a family of like six and i begged them they had a suburban and they drove me down the nice. drive down took like 90 minutes it's a wow yeah descent. on a drive with a car um, the funny story is we found out they live two blocks away from me in Reno. Are you serious? No <laughs> way. <So> funny. <laughs> yeah. um, one, one bit of information to add, too, is you do have to pay at a gate if you do this climb. So look at the fees. I think they just raised um, in December, I think, yeah. or something like that. So uh, it's something like 13 bucks or something like that. And there was a car ahead of me, and I went up and I said, you know, you get you ride a lot and your face is cold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's like, Can I go party on Indy with fast time Strata? <laughs> <laughs> and he just looked at me, and before they even answered, I like got in front and like, Here's my credit card, or it was cash, I forget which one, yeah. and went. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. you can probably have somebody go if you really want to set a time, Amanda, then you can have somebody probably go ahead and be ready to pay for you when you go through. Oh, yeah, if that's so. really 30 seconds, I was pretty happy to hey, stop. Man. KOMs have been lost by less. So true. Um, so yeah, Amber, uh, but yeah, you can absolutely do it though. This is like this almost like broke my heart to hear like say like, is there ever any hope of me climbing? Like absolutely, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, for sure. Right. I, I will say just on the downhill. I think keeping warm on a descent like that. One of the most important things is your base layer. So just bringing an extra base layer so you can put a dry one at the top. Yeah. And if you like potato chips, when you're done with the potato chips, just stuff the bag down the front of your jersey. It's mm. really nice wind block. Yeah. And two, <laughs> Amanda, you said you do one or two centuries a year. Uh, that's like the same time as it's going to take you to do mm -hmm. Haleakala. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like you can do it. Yeah. Uh, Amber, you said you put something in your growth versus fixed mindset. Yeah. Have you guys talked about this on the podcast before? Uh, I think, didn't you I talk about I think it? I might have I mentioned know, but do it. do it again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll, do I'll do a quick, a brief overview. So uh, this is originally the work of psychologist Dr. Carol Dweck, and she was looking at elementary school kids, and some of the kids, you know, had been told from a really young age, like, you're really, really smart. And what she found was the kids who'd been told that they were really smart internalized this as this was like an innate fixed capacity. So if they didn't do well on a test or on a puzzle, they thought it meant they weren't smart enough. Uh -huh. Whereas kids who hadn't been told that had what she labeled the growth mindset. So if they struggled on a test or with a puzzle, their reaction to it wasn't that I'm not capable. It was, oh, I need to try harder or I need to try differently. And I think this is a really important thing to get to with sport is, you know, there's always room for improvement. There's always room for improvement. It doesn't matter how good you get. In fact, the better you get, the more you realize <laughs> you could be doing or, or the, you know, the, the goalposts just keep shifting, which is actually really fun because it never gets boring. There's always mm -hmm. something you can be doing. So I just, I would just say, you know, adopt a growth mindset here. There's nothing, you know, as far as I know ab about you, there's nothing that's like limiting you from being able to do this. Yeah. Totally. Just, just keep trying. A good thing with kids too. I mean, yeah. with my young kids, yeah. I'm just like try harder, try harder. Just try harder. Yeah. And we always uh, say, Wow, we're so proud of how tr how hard you tried on that, yeah. rather than how smart you are. Yeah, right. uh, yep. what you accomplished necessarily. It's yeah. just about the yeah, it's about the effort that you put in. Yep. Yeah. That goes too with our previous question. I forgot the name about the uh, can I ever qualify? Yeah. yeah. Right. Like exactly. Don't, don't like yeah, you can. Yes, you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The answer is yes, really. So let's go into live questions. Cool. This one's from Brian. He says, if I do plan builder now, in other words, use plan builder now, how does that work with the current training plan that I'm on? Does it understand where I'm at or do I tell it to start when I originally started the other plan? Yeah, you tell it to start where you originally started the other plan. Yep. And I, I know it's like, it'd be cool if we could have figured it out automatically, but we talked about it. It was like a, like at most it's going to be a, like a six week problem because mm -hmm. then you're on like another block or so, or maybe a little bit more, but um, the amount of time it would have taken to do that like what it pushes out even farther and no one wants that. So yeah. one, one bit, one bit of information with this too, is you may m notice that like it, it changes the trajectory trajectory of the uh, trajectory of what you're doing. And the, the whole point of plan builder is it's like an evolutionary step for us. It's, it's the next level of training understanding that we have. Yeah. It's not the end. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's the next growth step. mindset. It's continuous. Yes, exactly. Yes. Growth mindset. It's yes. getting better. <laughs> so if it differs from what you had, just know that this is the best training that you could have right now. And it's going to continually improve. Uh, ben says, my 18-year-old daughter is getting into triathlons and is using Trainer Road to prepare for her events. Where is a good place for her to go to get a women's specific or to, for women specific questions about discomfort with saddle discomfort mm -hmm. and to get those ones answered? Yeah. Um <clears throat> 
go to your local bike shop. Find out if there's other women cyclists in the area because it's a lot easier to talk about this with other women. Um, chances are they've experienced whatever the specific discomfort is that she has. Um, I know there's a thread about this on the forum too. So if she wants to hop on there and ask, you know, I can help answer some questions as well. But the the bottom line, to t the, the takeaway from this is to know that some discomfort is going to be normal, but it should never be debilitating. Like it should never be something that prevents you from riding. It should never be something that keeps you off the bike for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I hate to even say that discomfort is normal. Um, there is like, I, every time I take time off the bike and get back on, I do feel like there's this adaptation <laughs> period where it's like, Oh yeah, this is what it, it does get easier. The more you ride, like there's sort of this adaptation to just being used to being on the saddle again, that does help. Mm -hmm. But, um, there are literally just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different types of saddles out there. So for anybody who's just getting started or anybody who's struggling with this, just know that there it, there's always going to be a good saddle for you. It just sometimes it takes some time to find it. So bike shops will often have demo fleets of saddles that you can try. Um, and if you're not comfortable talking to the people at your bike shop, ask them if there's any local athletes that might be willing to have that conversation with you because I guarantee that there are. And most women are really happy to talk about this. I know it doesn't – this isn't uh... – doesn't really matter what your one is, but what is your TT bike saddle? I actually really like the ISM Adamo. So I'm on the PN3, and I've talked to a few people about this. It seems like it works pretty well for a lot of people, but everybody's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody's position's yeah. different. Um, so I think it can help to get a recommendation because it kind of gets you further along in the search process, and it can help you you know, eliminate options, but it's just a trial and error thing. You just have to figure out what works for you, but do know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not like yeah. an eternal trial and error process. Uh, next one is a bike fit question from Jens it says recently got a TT bike. What are some basic bike fits, uh, TT bike fit tips compared to road bikes? Um, mm. so this will vary entirely depending on who you speak to. Cause, uh, yes. believe it or not, there are no shortage of opinions on bike fits. Well, um, <laughs> so there's a trend. And um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just totally different. Yeah. So uh, the trend is uh, on a TT bike compared to your road bike, it's going to be more forward. Um, and when you go more forward, you're going to have to raise your saddle because to keep the same distance between your bottom bracket and your contact point on your saddle, if you move the saddle forward, it's going to be steeper, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's kind of like rotating your whole body forward. And there's a lot of like, if you Google it, you'll see this a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'll see this in top triathletes. It almost looks like they're pedaling backwards. And people even say that, the pedaling backwards look. Uh, because triathletes don't have the restrictions that UCI athletes have, right. they can really go extreme with their positions. And a lot of the time they will be very far forward on the bike. Yeah. And then it looks like when they're pedaling, like their legs are almost pushing back toward the back portion of the pedal stroke. And there, the nice part about this is that it opens up the hip angle quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the drive for, it, especially because these people are going to start running and refer triathlon. But also having an open hip angle usually means that you can put out more power, usually, but not necessarily. It's not like every person is going to be uh, like that. So what, so when you talk about forward... It's just rotating the position forward. Yep, exactly. Then the... then, sorry, one, one point with this is think the one part you cannot move on your bike is your bottom bracket. So like if you do have a position, it just kind of rotates around that axis, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you're changing things, it shouldn't change wildly at the other points. It should all change in relation to that bottom bracket. So would you have anything else to add to that? No, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, okay. So for me, <laughs> I have a theory. The trend. Uh, I have struggled with TT bike fits for so, so long. I've mm -hmm. had very reputable people and retool and Dan Amfield and stuff put me in positions. And the problem is with UCI rules, I cannot get in a position um, with how far my arms go out. Like I have long arms where uh, you see it on the video. They look extremely <laughs> long right now they, because they the are extremely distortion. long. Um, <laughs> yeah. But when I, Okay. There we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, Get it long. closer to the lens. Yep, um, <laughs> yeah. So when I do this, uh, I literally have nothing to grab onto. Yeah. Or like I'm like. His extensions end like on his forearms. His hands are, it's, it's bad. Yeah. yeah. Or so it's dangerous. What, and I think for tall people, maybe this whole thing is not right. Mm -hmm. For very long legged people, people too, like me that are tall. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I'm going to keep my exact same road position from saddle to bottom bracket. And then, like, how I would do a, uh, a t um, be in the drops, mm -hmm. uh, like on my road bike, try to keep that angle and just move my arms to the center, mm -hmm. have them angled up a little bit, turtle, and I want to bring this to the wind tunnel, but I think I'm going to be able to put out just as much power as I can on the road bike in the drops, mm -hmm. which is way more than I can when I lose um, 
in this like rotated forward position, I lose so much power. Mm -hmm. Like I think when we did the Ram test back to back, it was like 21 Watts or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I will be even more arrow too, because my saddle position will be so much lower and my front end actually gets lower. I I have a Tucker, you want to put that position. I just kind of messed around on my TT on my road bike of what the position would look like. Uh, yeah, it's in bike racing. We could put it, you put a live or put in the forum, but I, I'm, I'm much more like laid out long, long, but I think it could, I think yeah. it could work. It's, it's some, some rules of thumb generally with bike fit, uh, especially TT fit is generally you'll see, but not across the board. All of these can be broken, but, uh, hands being risen up is pretty common. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they raise the hands up to close off the chest cavity and, and the drag that that would cause head. Your head is very slow. Uh, and it's a, and it can be a big problem if it's sticking up far above the rest of your body. So you'll see bike fitters trying to get a position where the head falls in line. So that if you were to look at it head on at like an even elevation, you wouldn't see the head would kind of blend into the body. Mm-hmm. And that's a helmet choice is really big with that. Uh, but the, the general principle that they're trying to go for is they're trying to just close off that cavernous open space of your chest and then make your head not be so much of an obstacle for the wind. Uh, but the tricky part is balancing that with being powerful. Right. So. The trade-off is always, you know, if you get more arrow, are you losing power? Mm-hmm. And so how much power are you willing to sacrifice to get the arrow benefit? Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing about this is just, especially if you're trying to get into an aggressive TT position, you know, make the changes slowly, spend enough time on your TT bike, especially if you're, if you're doing a lot of training on your road bike and then you plan to race on your TT bike, spend enough time on your TT bike so that you can put out power in that position, that you're not going to screw up your lower back. Um, and you can actually do a lot of off the bike work on this too, to, to be able to activate, you know, your glutes and your hamstrings in that more forward position with a more closed hip angle. Um, hamstring stretching, I think personally helped me with this. I know mm-hmm. there's a lot of strong opinions about stretching. Um, but for me that made a difference. So, uh, it's, yeah, you got to figure out what works for you and don't, don't jump straight into a really aggressive position. You can, you can ease into it with stack height, um, things like that. Yep. Last question that we're going to cover is a request. And this one comes from D prim from the forum. I think it says just a reminder, many of us want to hear about the incorporation of the new Fisher price trainer. Uh, so if you go to dcraymaker.com, he recently put up like uh, an article on this, which was, it was really cute uh, with his little girls training with him. Um, <laughs> and there's like this little Fisher Price trainer that he had. And yes, it is supported in virtual power. Uh, we so we, we cr- and you can cruise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we may or may can, not. Uh, <laughs> we took some liberties with the creation of this virtual power curve. In this case, we didn't actually have like usually, you know, it's like taking multiple data points and like going through and creating it. And in this case, we just kind of made it really fast. So if your toddler's putting out 400 watts, don't worry, everything's fine. <laughs> so uh, if you go to virtual power, you can select the manufacturer's Fisher Price, and then it's the I think it's the Think and Learn smart cycle is what it's it's the only one in there it's hilarious (laughs) so um but yeah you can check that out it's pretty pretty funny stuff so uh with that thanks everybody for joining us uh next week is a holiday so uh we will be shifting our schedule slightly Uh, as a result we'll be recording on tuesday of next week all four of us uh i think so that's the plan as of now so uh yeah yes sick rock on (laughs) sick yeah um so uh all four of us and it'll be tuesday morning and it'll be the normal time of 8 a.m. Pacific. So that'll be December 24th, Christmas Eve. And we'll be recording then. So you can join us there. And uh, once again, just a couple of things. If you do want to help us out, it's sharing this podcast with people is hugely helpful. Uh, you can go to trainerroad.com slash reviews and you can leave a review that then other people will be able to see. And of course, you can also check out Plan Builder. It's huge. Um, people are loving it. It's really fun. So That's getting awesome. people on a solid training track, it'll just build your plan for you. So check that out and we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.